I'm Nick Von Walkerbarth, and you're listening to the Von Dubcast. If you don't want to listen to me gap in the intro and you want to skip right to the interview, skip about five minutes. But before you do, please consider doing one of these couple things that really helps out the show. Um, following the social medias for, this, for the Von Dubcast, subscribing, uh, and leaving a review. If you could do those things, that'd be awesome. Also, give me a, a subscription on the YouTube channel. That'd be great, too. All right, welcome everybody. Episode number 72 of the Von Dubcast. Um, a really musical episode for you guys today. I have my buddy Mike Sheehan on. Uh, Mike is a guy that I met, honestly, just through Instagram. Uh, a couple of years ago, it must have been around the time I was going to university. Maybe it was the time I just picked up a guitar. I might have still been in high school, but I was learning guitar and uh, you know, watching these Instagram people like... Uh, uh, like Mike and uh, Nick Hames, and I think we talk, talk about a couple of these people uh, in the episode, but just all over Instagram is a great place for people that were, uh, you know, trying to chase a musical dream to just, you know, show their stuff and learn a few things. And uh, Mike used to always hop on Instagram live and just play songs and give some tips. And I would ask about certain chords and, hey, I struggle playing this song. And he was just always this really upbeat guy that loved music, loved playing guitar, and he loved John Mayer and Ed Sheeran, who at that time, I mean, still to this day, John Mayer is my favorite. He's he's the GOAT. I, I love him, as you guys will hear throughout this episode. Um, but he loved him just as much, and we would commiserate. And I was, one time saw him in this uh, this hoodie. Actually, if you watch the video for this episode, I was wearing the same hoodie because I had to ask him where he got it. It's this Continuum hoodie, one of my favorite albums from John Mayer. And I saw him playing on an Instagram Live one, and I just jumped in and said, where did you get that hoodie? I need it. And it was somewhere on Etsy, and I he sent me a link and got me uh, hooked up with it. And then, uh, yeah, so it was nice. I hadn't talked to Mike in probably two or three years at this point. I hadn't been on Instagram Live with him, so it was so much fun to catch up, see what he's been up to uh, during the pandemic, um, what kind of songs he's into, grabbed it bunch of new awesome recommendations i checked out a few of them they're awesome if you hear us throw a name out in this episode check them out you probably won't regret it if you're into this type of music and uh funnily enough the timing is perfect i think actually this episode should come out monday i think friday john mayer if you're a john mayer fan or if maybe you just want to give him a, a second chance after listening to us uh, gush about him for a couple hours here uh, i think his new single is going to come out on friday and then i think a, a whole nother album a couple weeks after that. So I'm really excited for that. I hope after this episode, you guys are really excited for that. And if not, you know, we still uh, talk about a lot of things other than John Mayer on this episode. And I think uh, it's just a great musical. If, if you like music at all, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So uh, yeah, give it a shot. Let me know what you think. Um, if you uh, enjoy what you hear, maybe head over to Mike's Instagram, check him out. He didn't really have anything uh you know, that he really needs to plug and get you guys to see, but he's just a really fun guy, really nice guy. And, uh, if you could, you know, head his way and tell him you enjoyed the conversation, that always goes a long way. Maybe drop a like on some of his music videos and support him because he just, uh, he really enjoys music in a way that I think pe more people can learn from. And I feel like everybody needs something in their life that can really grab them and just shake them around. And, and that hits them, uh, you know, past the skin, hit some deep, you know, whether it's in your gut or in your chest, that's something that just grabs you. And that might be music. That might be something else, but if it is music for you, it's nothing to be ashamed of. And I, and I feel like that it was so much fun to uh, talk to somebody like Mike that is as unashamedly attached to his favorite uh, artists as I am. And just allows that freedom just to gush and talk about them. Like so many people that are listening, this probably has one or two artists that they would just sound exactly like me and Mike did today or on this, uh, when we recorded this episode talking about John Mayer. So hopefully you can just substitute John Mayer for whoever you're thinking about. And you'll really uh, appreciate what we had to say on this. And uh, if you ever think about picking up guitar and learning it, there's a lot of really great tips that I think we uh, passed along uh, throughout the episode. So you can get that as well. Um, if you do enjoy it, pass it on to a friend. If you know someone that's just picking up guitar or uh, is a John Mayer fan or a fan of any of these people that we kind of went through, Ed Sheeran and any of these guys, um, please pass it on to them. Um, like always, if you could give me a follow on Instagram, Twitter, uh, the YouTube page where I know I say this every week, but the YouTube page is getting updated. We have a plan in place. Um, episode 49 went up. That's the first, that's kind of where we stalled out was on episode 48. Um, just sent over the files for episode 50, which is a great episode with T in the studio. I was really proud of that one and was uh, upset that it wasn't on uh, YouTube for your guys' watching pleasure as well, but that should be up there soon. And then by the end of July, I think we have a plan to have it completely caught up. It depends how many episodes I put out between now and then. Uh, that might determine how caught up we get, but Things are rolling, plans are in action. It makes me so happy to know that that YouTube page is getting caught back up. Um, and I can't wait to uh, just take this uh, 
exactly what I've been saying. I'm going to take it for you guys who have been listening over the last uh, few months. We're coming up on a year of the podcast. June 21st was the day I released it. So we're uh, coming up on that quick. Uh, I just did a solo episode that I recorded yesterday that'll probably come out later this week, maybe Thursday or Friday. Uh, really catches you guys up on what I've been up to and how I've been feeling. And I think that just goes along with uh, coming up on a year of doing this and just kind of reflecting on that. And I'm sure I'll have to do a solo episode that I just kind of do a year in review of everything I've learned because I feel like I've learned so much just having to sit across, from, not having to, getting to sit across from interesting people week after week and just have a couple hours of deep conversation that lets me see who they are and change my ideas. So I just feel like I have leveled up so much over this past year and I just want to maybe take a, take a, an hour or two to break down exactly what I've learned for you guys. And maybe you guys can learn a little something as well along the way. So yeah, that's kind of a couple things on the, on the horizon that are coming up. Hope you guys uh, stay along for the journey. Hope things are going well in your world. Hope uh, everything's staying positive. Um, I know that's tough to do when uh, you know, other things, life is just tough and and it beats you down, but Try and be thankful, try and find the positives, try and find the silver linings, try and take your own accountability, even if it's something that is so far out of your control, even if you can find that one tiny sliver of it that is accountable to you and that you can take some accountability from, you will be better off for it. So yeah, hope you guys have a great week. I will see you a little bit on the intro and then I'll see you next week or later this one. Bye. All right. Thanks for being here, Mike. This is uh, a nice reunion. We used to play guitar on Instagram and, yeah. and, and all sorts of things. It's a kind of a, a social media friendship that we got to uh, bring into the real world here a little bit. Yeah, which it's it's cool how that happens. I love Instagram for that reason. Um, I'd say Instagram especially. I've had the most like interactions with people like um like Nick Hames. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, Nick and I. Have, I've met Nick. We've talked pretty frequently about his music guitars and all kinds of other stuff but you i remember you being one of the first people i kind of like linked up with on instagram and we just shoot stuff back and forth like oh like great playing or you know i'm learning yeah, stuff what do you yeah, think yeah. you know did you get that nice continuum hoodie that i did you get that continuum hoodie i was like, yeah, oh, like yeah. you know, i gotta find mine i it's it's somewhere in there i have it i didn't get rid of it but yeah oh, yeah so i i think as our boy john stated very well twitter's great for ideas it's like instagram's good for art yeah. And you see, you know, like this right here is like a passion project. It's the thing you're doing. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm all for it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's the same thing with friends of mine who are doing music or they're doing their own art and, you know, their own kind of thing. It's mm-hmm. Instagram, I think, has become this way to like really just hone in on like one thing that you you love and you can go do it. No one's yeah. Says- yeah, it gives you kind of the freedom to chase whatever whatever you're passionate about as long as it fits into if you can somehow mold it into that Instagram metric. And that was uh it's funny you bring up Nick Hames because that's exactly what I was gonna say. When I first started playing guitar, yeah, I was just terrible at it. But I, I went on Instagram and I was like, you know, following a couple of guitar players and you were the you two were the ones that I followed a lot and uh, you know, interacted with and asked questions and tips, and then you do those lives and I'd hop in and watch you play songs, learn songs along with you and you know, throw oh, out my requests. It was uh it, it was lots of fun. And I and I'm curious, uh, just because guitar and I'm sure we'll get into John Mayer later, but oh, okay. mainly mainly guitar is what uh, brought us together. And I'm curious, when did you start playing and how did that come about? Were you always a musical guy or is it something you just picked up one day? A uh, great question. Okay. So I, I won. Yeah. When was this? I want to say this is 2017. So growing up, I've always been kind of like musical, like musically in that world. And yeah. I played saxophone in middle school up through high school. And for a year and a half at uh, the first college I attended before I transferred, so I did the like, college band stuff and then I went to a different college. I did like their college band for a little bit. So I played saxophone for a long time growing up. Right. And then my senior year, I see, yeah, I'd say my senior year of high school, there's a small band. You might've heard of 21 pilots. Oh yeah. <laughs> they, for, for some reason, they came to my hometown in Adrian, Michigan. They opened up for Owl City in Neon Trees at Adrian. Wow. College. And it was a very last minute thing, but I went there and I saw them play and you know, the song House of Gold with the ukulele. Yeah, I think so. You probably know it, but yeah, yeah. I remember being like, that's a cool song. And a ukulele seems like, yeah, it seems like a fun thing to just kind of learn to do. So, yeah. you know, in senior year, Brandon, I was like, I got a ukulele. I learned a bunch of songs. I, I'd have to go back and learn a bunch of them again. But yeah, yeah. at the time I was like, okay, like, you know, I got a ukulele. This is fun. This is light. Like, this will probably be the extent to what I ever do in terms of like string instruments. But I've always wanted to play guitar as a kid. 
Yeah. And my parents were always like, you're never going to play. Like if we get it for you, you're, you're not going to play. Yeah. You'll play it for two weeks and they'll put it down. Or- you'll play it for two weeks and get it. And I, you know, part of me understood that. And I was kind of like, yeah, okay. You know, whatever. And I ended up getting saxophone. They're like, you know, if we get you the saxophone, you know, you're in, you're locked in for band. And I was like, okay. And so I did it. And I had some of my best friends playing with me and, you know, band and like we do some university band stuff. It was great. But I was just, I always kept coming back to it. And one of my friends, my first, I'm trying to think, well, yeah, one of my roommates at Central Michigan, he had a guitar. So I would kind of noodle around with it a little bit, but it was a 12 string. So I was just like, a, a light noodling. Yeah, light, a little, little light noodling, but all it was right, a 12, right. 12 yeah. string guitar, oh. which is just insane to just kind of like pick one up and be like, okay, I got this. So I was yeah. kind of like, okay, this is too much. I can't figure this out. I'm going back to ukulele. So I just kept playing ukulele. Yeah. And like one day in 2017, I was hanging out with my friends and I was just like, I think I'm going to buy a guitar today. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to go. Like, you're going to drive down to Toledo, Ohio, which is like 45 minutes from my house in Adrian. I'm like, and I'm going to go to Guitar Center and I'm just going to get something. I'm like, because I just, I had been listening to a lot of like heavy guitar music, a lot of blues stuff, you know, and I just was like, I want to learn how to do this. Yeah. And I was kind of like, if I buy it, it's my own money, right? Like I have some stake in this. Nobody can say shit. Yeah, no one can say you're never going to play it. Like, you know, I yeah. bought it. I'm going to play it. I'm going to do this. It's going to be great. So I bought a guitar. I bought this Squire Stratocaster in 2017, I think, with a little 10-watt Fender amp. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing ever. So you and started with an electric guitar, hey? I started with electric guitar. Wow. Which I know, which a lot of people were like, well, you went electric first? And I was kind of like, yeah, I know. Well, then looking back on it. I probably should have gone acoustic first because I think, you know, there's a lot you be starting off like as a beginner is an acoustic guitar. It's so good. And it's, I think a little more forgiving than electric. Yeah. And so I got an electric. I'm like, okay, we're going to learn vultures. We're going to learn gravity. We're going to learn yeah. all the John Mayer songs. And if you're a John Mayer fan, if you hear this, you'll understand that that's insane. Yeah. It's just like pick up a guitar. And I'm like, I'm going to learn John Mayer songs mm-hmm. because they're impossible. Yeah. It almost feels like when you're trying to learn a John Mayer song that John Mayer makes his songs just i want to make a song that nobody will ever be able to play like me right? like oh, that's yeah. how it feels oh, i mean oh we'll get into that i know some yeah. of his songs that he the way he wrote them it's like only you could do this so yeah. so then comes the phrase or like this the phase of being just overly frustrated like ah, shit like this is just so tough but you mm-hmm. know you stick with it you're like okay but i really love that world of like you know music and guitar so i kept playing kept playing you know christmas a few years later got the ed sheeran martin acoustic guitar yeah you know, which I and I didn't want something big. I wanted something that was acoustic that I could kind of just bring around with me. Which Ed Sheeran guitar did you get? I got the Multiply. Yeah, the Multiply one. Multiply one. Is that the one that I have? Is it that? Is that the darker one or the light one? It's the green one. So there's like little green X's on the frets. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah that was a nice guitar. Yeah, that's the one that Nick Hames has that he actually won it through guitars. I'm the one that's signed by Ed Sheeran. Yeah, I like, was very like, jealous of that. Yeah, yeah I, so was I. And every now and then he'll send me a video of like playing. He's like, I don't play it a lot. It kind of hangs up. I will play it. I'm like, dude, that's insane. Yeah. So, so I got that one. And and at first I was kind of like, okay, you know, this is not, I didn't want something too big because I feel like acoustic guitar when you're learning, if it's big body, like it's kind of awkward, like your arm hangs over for some reason. And again, you know, I wanted something in that, like, you know, parlor kind of shape like something smaller like an om model yeah without having to spend an arm and a leg for an orchestral mm-hmm. martin guitar so yeah. i got that and i still have it i still play it pretty much every day like i'll just be like watching tv and i'll just kind of pick it up and kind of strum along play some stuff and then i end up getting uh a mexican fender telecaster christmas few years later and then like a prs amp so you know you, you get things over the years but yeah it's i gotta tell you i never get tired of it yeah that's I awesome. Never, I never get tired of it. And, you know, my parents will call me every now and then they're like, you know, you're still playing guitar. I'm like, oh yeah. Like that hasn't changed. Like, you know, I work a lot and I'm out, you know, seeing people if I can with COVID restrictions and whatnot, but I still try to play as much as I can whenever I can. And if I'll just be listening to music, like oh, that's a, that's a cool riff or that's cool. Like what's, what's that about? And, you know, you, you pick up bands. I feel like later in life, you pick up some bands. Like I didn't understand Grateful Dead in high school. And then, yeah. you know, and I got into a little bit before John Mayer joined. Like I did not at all. Yeah, see, I got into it enough. Like I don't know if you can see this. It's a pumpkin. It's plastic. Nice. You have to steal your face thing. So like I'm a I'm a deadhead. You know I listen to all kinds of stuff. You know Tom Mish, another really 
chill kind of guy. And I think yeah. if you're all over the place, you keep finding things that interest you, mm-hmm. you know, musically. And you're like, okay, like, that's cool. Like, you know, and it's just one of those things that I never get tired of. And I feel like mm-hmm. with a guitar, you never have to put it down because you're always going to find something like, well, oh, that's cool. Or yeah, oh, that's cool. I didn't know I could do that. And then you get effects and it's a whole thing. You know, it, it goes on forever. It's as you can get as deep into it as you want. And no matter where you get into it, you're always going to have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was something that I found too, is just, uh, I always, I feel like I got into guitar to try and impress girls for sure. Like that was the first entryway. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sure. Like I I'd have to really cast myself back to when I first started to, to give you that for sure. But I, I'm fairly certain that's about 99% of the reasons I did oh, everything yeah. I did for the first 23 years of my life. But <laughs> then once you start and once you, once you learn your first song on your own, I think it that's grabs sweet. you and it's just the coolest feeling. And then the next time you learn one, the next time you learn one, then you get this weird thing where you'll try a song that's too hard for you and you'll learn other songs. You'll come back to it a couple months and it's so much easier and you can pick it up. And that feeling yeah. of play, trying to play a song and be like, this is just beyond me. I will never be able to play this. And then to come back to it a few months later and be able to play it like nothing is just, it's hard to explain to people how cool the feeling is of it's learning really, that. It's, I think it's like, how, how do I want to put this? It's like the best like legal drug you can have, you know, <laughs> like you're, you're never going to like crash and burn in like a catastrophic way on it. You're always going to be like, Oh my God, like I just learned how to do this. Like this, I never thought I'd learn this. Yeah. And there's always that, like, I'll never learn this. And then you learn it. And you're like, okay, well like, I'll never learn this. And then right. you kind of learn it. like, it, yeah. you just keep getting, I think more comfortable and better. And I think the other thing you have to figure out is like, what kind of guitar player you want to be. Mm-hmm. Do you want to be the guy who's like, you know, sitting out just playing acoustic songs? Like, yeah, everyone loves being that guy. Yes. That's There's me. That's, that. me. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. Do you want to be, you know, hardcore blues guy? Do you want to just be kind of jamming along? I just kind of fall into the pocket of whatever I'm happy with. Yeah. Whatever just interests you. Whatever interests you go with it. There's no wrong answer for it. I think people look at that. They're like, well, I got to learn this. Like you learn what you want to learn and you put in what you want to put in, but as long as you're having fun, like it is worth it. Right. And, and I will say if there are people who are like, you know, don't give up, like, yeah, don't give up. Like it is, it is definitely rewarding. And it's one of those things that once you have it in your toolbox, like, yeah, you can just keep working on other stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and you can, and you cannot play for a couple of months, pick it right back up and your, and you know, your fingers are hurt a little bit. But also, yeah. The, the muscle memory is still there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's been times where I've gone, couple of weeks where just you know this craziness or i've been traveling and i didn't have a guitar with me and you come back it's like the first thing i do i'm like okay can i still do this and I'm yeah like, my hand hurts but like yeah it's still there and like i don't even care that my hand hurts because i'm happy mm-hmm. doing it again yeah yeah that's that's kind of the point i got to the last couple of weeks i uh i haven't played much in the last probably four years mm-hmm. maybe even a little bit longer like i just uh when when i was in university i had my guitar in my little you know residence bedroom that's you know a, a room the size of this office i'm in right now and that's what you live in so your guitar is always right there you can always pick it up i play all the time right just little riffs whatever that and that was lots of fun and then when i graduated and i moved and i started working full time and you're just you're, you're so exhausted it's just that one extra step i just stopped playing and 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 every once in a while it would catch me right like you one of the big things if you hear a song that you want to learn that is always oh, okay i want to pick that up or you hear a cool a cool riff that you want to learn that was always something, but then I started listening to way less music and started listening to more podcasts and it really fell off. And yeah. I found that just actually maybe like two or three weekends ago, I picked up the guitar. Uh, Cause I was playing, there's another guy around that I had taught guitar a couple of years ago and he's really picked it up and we were just jamming them, showing him a few things. And I forgot how much fun it was just to pick up a guitar with somebody and just jam for like a couple of hours and just, you know, cause even if your fingers hurt after a while, you just forget about it and you're playing through it. Right. Like you're just, it is what it is. And it was so much fun to, and to remember all the songs you forgot, you knew. Like one of the oh. best tips I ever got from the guy that uh, first, uh, I don't know. I have a lot of people that first showed me guitar, but like one yeah. of the guys that was instrumental, he he told me this tip. He said, as you learn songs, you're going to forget that you learn them, right? Like you'll, you'll learn a song, but there's so many songs out there. It's impossible to like keep that repertoire in your head. I mean, maybe oh. some people can, but he said on your, on your iPhone, make a playlist for songs you've learned on guitar. And then as you learn new songs, just add it to that playlist. And then every, if you're jamming, you just throw that playlist on just next. Now, Oh, here's a song I used to know. I can probably pick that one up. And that has been like the best tip for being able to just hop back in and remember songs that you used to know. Cause I'm, I must've like, I must know a couple hundred songs, but if you put a guitar in my hands right now and ask me to play five different songs, that'd be tough. Cause I'd have to remember like, okay, how many songs do I know? Right. I'd be really oh, going yeah. back in the if vault. You, and 
So first off, that is that's fucking brilliant. You're so brilliant. That, yeah, that is so good. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's the same thing, and it's weird too, because like I don't know if this has ever happened to you. This has happened to me. It's like you'll be at like a co- like I was uh, I'd be at college parties every now and then, and like someone's like. Mikey, you play guitar, play something. I was like, what? I, what What do you want me to play? What do you want me to play? And yeah. they're just like, you know, play something you like. I'm like, okay, well, the things I like yeah. and the things I'm into at the moment are probably not yeah. going to be your Do you three. want John Mayer or John Mayer? Oh, do you want John Mayer, a little bit of Sheeran, or you want yeah. some weird dead, like, fusion yeah. crap, or, like some Tom Miss, like, weird chords yeah. that I love? Then you're like, well, this isn't Wonderwall. I'm like, all right, well, yeah. then, well anyways, here's Wonderwall. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's weird like the, that exact thing where you just start playing. You're like, I forgot about this song. I'm like, Oh, I didn't even know I had this locked in my memory or in my hands. Yeah. It's, that's, that's so weird. That happened to me though. I was playing, what was I playing? I was watching TV, just kind of messing around and I was playing already gone by Lil boom. There's a guitar part on that song, which is just super chill. Like, I don't really care for like, the music, like the instrumentals chill, but I'm yeah. just like, I'm like, why do I know this? And I'm just like, not in my head. I'm like, why, what am I doing? I look up this. I'm like, I didn't even know that I knew how to do that. So I haven't tried right. playing that in forever. So it's weird how they come back to you or, you know, you'll just be kind of messing around. You're like, well, this sounds familiar. And you move mm-hmm. the cable down or something like, Oh, great. It's, it's this yeah. song or it's that. So, so now that you're at the level that you are, because I, I think uh, even though it sounds like you started guitar way later than I did, you outstripped me quite quickly. I think even like in the first times on the, on, on like Instagram and stuff, I was like, Oh, you are way out ahead of me now. I know clearly because you play a lot, a lot more and probably have a little bit more talent, but I'm not going to admit to that. But I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, you know, it's just, but, just no, effort. It, but, but kind of where I, where, where I want to go with that question is I heard you mention earlier, there's a, a couple things when you're learning guitar, it's like, I'm never going to learn that. Right. And a couple for me, I remember when I was first learning like bar chords, I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do a bar chord. And for people listening, that don't know what a bar chord is. It's, when you see people play like an acoustic guitar and you see that little thing that moving around up and down the neck, it's called a capo to change the tune. You can also do that with your finger and then play a chord with the rest or make a chord with the rest of your remaining fingers somewhere on the neck. But it takes a lot of pressure to hold that index finger down to change the tuning of all six chords and or all six strings and make a chord with the rest of your fingers or some of the rest of your fingers. And that was just one of those things I thought I'd never get. And then eventually you it kind of comes to you, right? And then the next one after that was hammer-ons and, and pull-offs, right? Like, unless it was actually put into the chords on ultimateguitar.com that you need to do a hammer-on or a pull-off, I thought, I will never use these ever. And oh. then, I don't know at what point it was, maybe a year, maybe two years into playing, I started finding that I would just do, I was doing it automatically. And yeah. like, I'm not even thinking about it. And I don't know when or when not to, but it just, if it goes nice with the song, you know, if I play a song once, maybe the next time I go through, I'm starting to add all these things in that I'm not even consciously doing. And to try and explain that to someone like just the other weekend when I was playing with him, he was asking me that stuff. And I said, nobody ever told me this when I played. They just said like, they, they're they telling me like, oh yeah, like you can kind of learn it. And they tried to teach me it. And I just didn't compute. I had no idea. And I just said, don't even try and learn it. Just you'll accidentally do it sometimes and it'll start coming to you. Like it's natural, but like, it's hard to tell people. Like, I feel like now that I've learned guitar on my own, I feel like so much of the advice I got was shit <laughs> that I could tell them so much more of just like, don't oh, get a yeah. teacher, just do whatever interests you find a song that you really like that isn't too tough and just practice it a bunch. Right. Like yeah. find some chords that, you know, four chords and you'll have access to millions of songs that you can play. Right. And just learn from there. And then you can expand out and, and try. And then there'll be a song that you really like that you can play 90% of, but there's one chord you can't, but you'll mm-hmm. love the song so much. It'll force you to learn it. Cause even if, you know, every time you get to that part of the song, it sounds like shit, but you like the song so much, it'll pull you past that, that inconvenience and you'll get there. And then you have oh, a yeah. new chord in your bag. Now you, now you have, uh, you know, 10 billion songs you can play because you have one other chord. It's crazy how much, how multiplicative it is by just adding one more little tool to your tool bag. It opens up the world. And I know I said, I was going to make that a question that I just talked forever, but the question no, I had good, is yeah. for you <laughs> in your playing career, what were those things that you thought you'd never learn and then ended up just coming to you later on? Well, I mean, so right away, like, yeah, bar chords. Yeah. You try to perfectly. Like anyone listening. Yeah. It is. It's so unnatural to put your hand in a situation where like there's weird acute pressure on like one finger. Yeah. Like all your energy is on like your, we'll say your index finger. And then to make your hand, like the rest of your fingers, like make a shape while doing that. Yeah. It's so foreign and it doesn't make any sense. And I'd say to anybody who's trying to learn bar chords, just learn how to do an F. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Learn and and I remember starting off and I was like, 
F for fuck that. I'm never yeah. going to learn that chord. No, and everyone says fuck the F chord. My sister, I taught her to play a couple years ago. She still doesn't play F. So, well, she plays like the cheap, like C move down kind of yeah. F, but like yeah. that's about it. Yeah, no. So, I mean, if you can learn an F, if, if you want my advice, I don't know if it's good advice, but if you can learn an F and get comfortable with that, you're probably like well on your way to learning a lot of like things. Cause yeah, it's again, that's like the core, like bar chord that is a bar chord out of, out of like necessity, but you can, you can hack your way around it. And guitar is great because there are insane chords. And if you look at jazz stuff, like things make no sense and it's inversions. I don't understand it. I just pick it up and I'm like, okay, this is colors and shapes to me. I can probably hack this and figure this out. Yeah. So bar chords, that's one of those things that, like you said, you're just going to pick it up one day. Mm-hmm. And one day you'll do it without even thinking. You're like, did I just make enough? Like, sweet. And then just slide it down the frets. Make that yeah. same shape and just slide it down. And you're like, that's a cool sound. And then mm-hmm. you, it's amazing what that'll do. And again, the toolbox is so crucial. Just add these little things. Don't, you know, you're starting off and you have duct tape and WD-40. Mm-hmm. That's what you have in your toolbox. And you're going to figure out that you can pretty much fix anything with those two things. Yeah. And then you're going to start getting, you know, more tools and you just get better. But yeah. So I'd say bar chords, especially hammer-ons again, that's one of those weird things, especially like bluesy BB King stuff. Like Mm -hmm. you listen to it, you're like, I don't understand this. I understand hearing it, but I don't understand how like, you know, you can move your fingers quick enough to do that. And then after a while, you just kind of start doing it naturally. You put it in songs on your own. You're like, Oh, that worked. Or that feels weird, but like, I kind of like that. And you know, for me though, a lot of it was just like, again, I want to learn songs from John Mayer, but they're impossible. Yeah. So, you know, and I think starting off, like if there was the easiest song of John Mayer's to learn, I'd say just get an acoustic and do love on the weekend. I think it's like, yeah, four. there you go. I think it's like GC, uh, D maybe F thrown in there, but it's four chords. Right. Like, and that's the thing. So you can find simplified versions of songs, which is totally cool. But, you know, it's one of those things where you pick what you want to do. And if if you're stubborn like I am, I was like, I am going to learn Stop This Train. Yeah, tough one, eh? I am going to learn this song. And I just did um, about a month or two ago. Oh, and yeah. I, I kind of forget, like, the course. But, like, you know, I know the beginning. And it's this weird slap, like, rhythm. Yeah, technique. yeah. That's another one of those things. Like you start looking at, you know, your right hand doing this weird thing, following your left hand, and you just have to trust yourself and know that you're going to make mistakes along the way. And that's not mm-hmm. just with that song, but I'd say with so many songs, like changing the right hand will change the song completely. Yeah. And if you find a way that you're comfortable with, go with it. Or if you yeah. don't, it doesn't matter. But like, again, there's no rules to this. Like, again, mm-hmm. if you're having fun, great. But yeah, man, bar chords, hammer ons weird um yeah i mean weird chords i think another thing which this will sound stupid but like it's easy to do if you're not like used to it is like when you put a capo on a fret like everything's relative to that but it slides down so when you do a g on like you know second fret it's you have to move it down a little bit because if you don't you're like oh that sounds completely off that's not g yeah it's one of those things like you learn it very quickly like that doesn't sound the way it's supposed to but you know and a capo, I think, is one of those tools that once you have it, great. Because you can do so much with a capo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once you have it, yeah. An, an acoustic guitar and a capo, you can pretty much play any song uh, if you know yeah. a decent amount of chords. And it's funny that you uh, mentioned Stop This Train as uh, as one of those songs because actually that was the song I used to kind of show something. Uh, the the kid I was showing guitar to a couple weekends ago when I was playing, he was t- saying, uh, like, I'm, I'm getting better at playing playing some of these songs, but some of them I just can't sing along to because there's that there's some sort of disconnect. And I said, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. This was one of the biggest things that stumbled me. Some songs, the words go along very nicely to, with what you're playing. And sometimes the rhythm of what you're playing and the rhythm of what you're singing is very hard to do at once. Oh, right. Yeah. And it's a skill you have to build up. And I use stop this train because that was a song that I learned again, one of those tough ones, but like, it's one of those ones where you just force yourself because it's such a beautiful song. You just oh, want to yeah. be able to play it. And yeah. even if it doesn't sound that good. So I, I learned it, but then when I would try and sing along to it, it was, it went to shit, right? There was no way I could do it. So I figured out that in, if I, instead of picking it, I would just play like a little strum kind of slap thing with my right hand that matched the melody of the, 
of the words a little bit better, right? It doesn't sound exactly like the song, but it, it matches close enough. I could start playing that and then sing along to it. And then doing my kind of little chintzy version of it, I got good enough yeah. at learning that rhythm that now I can pick along to it and I can do it. And I was just saying like, sometimes there's going to be songs like that and you just need to figure out a way. Usually it's with your right hand because the chord structure isn't going to change too much with your left. But if you can find a different way to just find a, a strumming pattern or something that sounds good enough that will let, allow you to learn the rhythms and just get used to the song a little bit, get more comfortable with it, then that singing with it will come on next. But if you expect to be able to, if you can play guitar, you can sing and play guitar. That was another huge lesson I had to learn. Oh, I'm getting half decent at this guitar thing. And then you try and sing, even if the song matches up nice, that is still a whole new thing to learn is how to sing and play at the same time. I didn't even know how I didn't put that in. Like, I would say that's actually the hardest thing. Oh yeah. I didn't, you know, bar chords. Yeah. They're a bitch and everything else that I talked about. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. But and it's weird because like you're I feel like you're putting so much like of your mental focus on like, OK, what, what are my hands doing? OK, this yeah. sounds good. This is the right chord. OK. All right. How do I I sing now? OK, so you have to just trust your hands. And it's a very weird because you've been looking at your hands. You're like, OK, but like, no, like I the training wheels are off, you know, like you're on your own. And yeah, I remember I, I had a class at, um one of the colleges I was at. I, I've moved around a lot, but. And we had a guitar. I was a guitar class. I did it just kind of for fun, you know, and there was, yeah. there was some structure to it, but a lot of it was just kind of like, yeah, you know, we're gonna learn some songs. You're gonna learn some chord stuff. And by that point I knew enough that I could kind of like hack my way through, which was fine. Yeah. But it was another way to just kind of like chill and play with other people, which was mm-hmm. great. But we had a final and I had to play in this coffee shop and, you know, we did this like instrumental uh, song, like the, my, yeah, four of us did this song. And then, you know, my stepmom's just like, Oh yeah. You know, Mikey's Mikey can sing. And I, I had never like done a gig yeah. or anything. So they're like, all right, we're going to have Mikey come up. He's like, it's probably going to be a John Mayer song. I'm like, well, first off it is for sure. Cause that's yeah, what I guaranteed. Like, also, yeah. also, I mean, it's just like sink or swim, you know? And so I think I did love on the weekend and I was just like, Oh, this is terrifying because again, you're so used to doing one thing. And when you start singing, like it is completely different. And, and I, I can speak for myself on this. I don't know about you or other people, but like, the songs you listen to the most, the songs you want to sound like that person in some way or another, right? Yeah. Because you want it to be familiar to the people who hear it, but you still want to be true to yourself. You want to be yourself singing, but at the same yeah. time, you're like, I want this to sound at least like in the key, like, you know, notes hitting same. Yeah. 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 So in when the you, same range. Yeah. Yeah. In the same range. So you listen to some songs and like, again, that's why capo is so good because you can mm-hmm. change it. Yeah. If you don't like, you know, the key that that's in, just move the cable down, adjust your voice and you're mm-hmm. fine. But mm-hmm. yeah, singing and playing at the same time is just such a wild concept that I still catch myself every now and then. Like if I start singing a song, it's like either, you know, I'm really confident or I just don't care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's no in between. It's just like, you know, yeah, I guess I'll try it. And you start singing like, mm-hmm. da, 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 and like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Like it, it's insane. But, but I feel like there's just like some, like if I could lay out, if somebody was going to start playing guitar right now, I would just tell them like, at first trying to make the chord shapes is going to yep. be really hard. Then yep. trying what, then you'll know the shapes and you can do it, but trying to change between them is going to be really hard. Once you have that half as figured out, then you're going to suck at strumming and you thought you had strumming down, but then once you kind of have your other hand, then strumming is going to be really hard for a while. Then you'll kind of put all that together and then you're going to try and sing. And it's going to be like, you started all over again, right? Like, and then you're going to try a bar chord and then you're going to be like, you started all over again. Then you're going to try that, right? Like there's just so many areas where they don't tell you that there's these huge pitfalls in front of you. If you're just figuring it out on your own and you just got to stumble through them where I feel like if somebody's listening to this, that like, maybe that's what I'll title this episode is just things to know before you learn guitar. Right? Like, because I feel like I would have been so much more or in for so much less suffering. If I would have just had a small little list of these things that this is what you're about to prepare for. Like it's going to suck. You'll get through it. It's going to be fine. But just, yeah. I feel like that's probably if you pulled like if you had a hundred people that started and gave up on learning guitar, you would yeah. pull them. And it would be one of those moments I just said would be, I got to this point. I couldn't do this. And that's where I gave up. And it's just like, ah, that's so sad because you were just so close. Like just on the other right. side of that was this really fun time. And then yeah. you're going to hit another really shit time where it's going to feel exactly like where you quit. But if you get through that, there's this other really fun time. Right. And there's so much reward tied to all this. But I think when you're just lost in the dark where you just say, I will never like, this seems like magic. I will never be able to do this. And really, if you keep practicing another week, you're through it. Right. Like it's, and sometimes it's not even a week. Sometimes it's just a night. Like, like I'm talking about this, these aren't that long of periods, right? Like this is the, the, all those things I, 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 I said there, maybe not the singing part, but the rest of it, that's probably within the first couple of weeks of you playing, right? Like this is not some month long journey to get into this. You'll 
hit these hurdles and get over them quite quickly, but it can be devastating. <laughs> I'm trying to yeah, find I, the right word. It, it, it's it funny be. you keep mentioning these things. Like, fuck, I didn't even think of that. Like, yeah, that sucked. And I'm like, and it's not like you, you block out these things, but you're like, this happened so long ago. You so don't long ago. Yeah. And I totally agree. It's like, yeah. So you start off first, your hands are going to hurt like hell. Yeah. Oh yeah. That too. That too. I forgot hands about that. are going to hurt. And you're yeah. like, this sucks. I'm out. And I, people leave that phase. I'm like, if you left at phase one where your hands hurt, guitar was never meant for you. I'm sorry. Right. You know? And then, you know, you start learning chords. That's cool. Now make a G to C. And then you're like, wait, what? Like, yeah. on command like you don't let me just like rearrange myself yeah, i can't have five seconds to move my fingers all and then play the next chord yeah and, oh god that's that phase that, i think that might be one of the worst phases because there's but that phase never like, ends because then, then you learn a new chord and you have to learn how to transition to that yeah, chord and with the really, other ones doesn't yeah. end. You, you just get better at it like you it never ends at it. but i and that's so frustrating too because you'll learn something and you're like like i know that i can make that shape but i just can't <laughs> Quick enough, it's like, and the song does not go because you make a G and you're wait, hold on, hold on, C, yeah. boom, got it, hold on, F. Okay, this will take a while. Hold on, people. Like, yeah. and it's it is so disheartening because you know the chords on their own, and it's just the switching. And then after a while, you start getting better. You're like, oh hell yeah, I can do this. And then it's like, okay, oh, hey, by the way, do this. You're like, well, what the hell is that? I just learned this. So it it keeps you on your toes, but oh yeah, it's never boring. That's for I, sure. I, I feel like we're like. Play guitar. I mean, it is going to suck, but like play guitar. Yeah, yeah. it's it, that's the thing because it's going to suck, but yeah. it's so that that suck is so rewarding when you can do it. It's 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 so worth it, right? But it's just hard to explain to people why it's worth it and what you're going to go through and all that. But like you say, maybe it's just not for that person, right? Not everybody's meant to play guitar, but I and I but I never thought I was. I never I was never musical. I never played an instrument. Never touched an instrument until I just picked a guitar up one time and just you know found ultimate guitar.com which is yeah, awesome. like right the, now, yeah. can pretty much show you any song yeah, and how yeah. to play it or or marty songs on youtube you know like those are my yeah. two go-tos like oh probably, yeah absolutely. i should probably reach out to him and get him on this podcast at some yeah. point in the future because like, he probably taught me like half of my first 300 songs all came from him right of just watching his little youtube videos oh. and, and it's not to say the guitar is not for everybody because i think if you really want to do it you can do it yeah. but you have to want to do it and you have sure. to go and do it. And I, I think this is great conversation because no one ever told me the pitfalls, you know, everyone's like, yeah. Oh my God, like you're going to have so much fun. Like pretty soon you're going to be shredded, man. Like everybody guitar center, when they study the guitar, they basically, yeah, yeah. you're going to be the next Eddie Van Halen. You're like, this is the coolest fucking day of my life. And then you get there. You're like, I can do hot cross buns on one string, not even smoke on the water, just hot, yeah. cross, slide it down. And, and it is frustrating. And there were parts where I was like, this this isn't how do you do this and your brain's like how do you touch this string and this fret and slide it down and you figure shit out you know yeah you'll you'll figure you'll figure it out along the way i was yeah. uh i was curious to hear that you were you were a big john mayer fan before you started playing guitar because that was for me i i did i never disliked john mayer's music but i always just kind of had it in this category in my head of oh my mom used to listen to that right like this is kind of you know this is this is girl this is girl music right i don't listen to this stuff but then oh, yeah. I started playing guitar and I was like, Oh, I kind of enjoyed this. And then uh, somebody showed me neon by John oh, Mayer. And I watched him play it with my jaw on the fucking floor. I was in grade 11 or maybe grade 12. I can't remember. I was, I was in late high school. And I yeah. remember sitting at our computer at our home watching John Mayer do neon live. I can't remember where, where it was live. It's one of the most probably, popular ones. Probably live in uh, Los Angeles. Where I think it was. I think it was where yeah. light is. Yeah. And I, and I just sat, he opens up for himself. Solo acoustic. Like, oh, <laughs> come on. That, what a what a fucking badass but just to see it was like oh right away like I, I didn't know much about guitar but it was like oh this guy knows something right and then to fall deeper into his catalog and realize just what he can do and then to watch you know his documentary that's on youtube and and yeah, buy them. Yeah. oh yeah like which i've seen probably six times i'm sure oh, you, you you're the same right every every time somebody tries to tell me uh you know, they're, they're a big John Mayer fan. I always ask how many times have you seen that documentary on YouTube? Right. If, if any, if it's anything less than two, I can't talk to you. Right. We, we yeah, can't have this conversation. So, yeah. So I can figure this out. So when I was like six, um, it would have been 2000, 2001. Yeah. I would have been like, yeah, six years old. My dad got Rufus squares. Somebody at work was like, Hey, here's this guy, you know, he's kind of pop rock stuff. Yeah. I like young him. kid. Yeah. yeah. Young kid. You know, at the time John was what? 22, 23. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, it was yeah. So I was like six, and you know, I'd be in my dad's car, we'd be listening to this, and I just 
we had it on all the time. So I was like, yeah. okay, Rupert Squares became this very important album in my life mm-hmm. at a very young age. So I was like, John Mayer, cool. And I remember, you know, my family goes to a decent amount of Michigan State football games. So we drive to East Lansing, Michigan, and we'd go, but my dad had that CD. And so for like a whole football season, I just listened to that, you know, CD. Yeah. And for some reason, I'm like six years old. I was like, put on track seven. Track seven's 83. Yeah. And I don't know why, but at the time I was like, this is it. Like it, I was like six years old. I was and like, it's I, such a deep song too. Like <laughs> for a six year old. It's such, I know it's just crazy. It's such yeah. a deep song. And I remember just thinking like, you know, whatever happened to my lunchbox, when came a day, I got thrown away. Don't yeah. you think that's say in that decision. And I was like, <laughs> I'm six. I've thrown away my lunchbox on accident. Like I should have had some say in that. And so yeah. six year old me is like, I get this. And that whole song is about him being like eight or six. Being yeah. So to listen to that as a kid, I was like, that's weird. Like he wants to be a kid again. And now I'm 25. And I'm like, I, f- I knew then that it meant so much to be a yeah. kid. Now you yeah. go to like, this sucks, but. Oh, that's hilarious. I know. Right. So that came out and then heavier things came out, which is mm-hmm. my absolute favorite John Mayer album. Everyone yeah. will normally go to continuum, which I totally get, mm-hmm. but heavier things for some reason, musically was very different. I feel like from room for squares. And when clarity comes on, uh, just leave me alone for four yeah, minutes. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I am in. Nobody my, talk to me. Yeah. Nobody talk to me. Nobody look at me. That is my ringtone. If you call me, I normally let it go to voicemail because I listen to. I'm like, I'm not hanging up. I'm not answering. Yeah. The yeah. And I got to see him play it live. Uh, <sighs> summers ago. Oh yeah. So I've seen him four times. Like, you seen him four times? Oh, I'm so times. jealous. It's, and he played Clarity live. I I cried a little bit. I was terrible. Oh up. yeah. I mean, it's my favorite song of all time. And to hear that live, I was like, this is insane. But. To answer something, well, you're one of your questions. Like, so yeah, I've been deep on John Mayer for a long time. And around high school, right when he it was a Battle Studies came out, I think it was in eighth grade. That would have been 2009. Yeah, it was in eighth yeah. grade. And Battle Studies came out. And I remember listening to that. And, you know, Continuum's great. Love Continuum. Loved Live Los Angeles. So I'm following him as I'm getting older. I'm like, I'm following this career. And a lot of my friends were kind of like, they weren't into it. So um, you think middle school, you think like Fall Out Boy stuff. You think 303. You think all these like bands that, a lot of kids listen to you. I'm over here. I'm like, John Mayer. They're like, yeah. what is wrong with you? I was like, I don't know, but this is my guy. Like, this is my dark horse. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm all in on him and always have been. Yeah. And I took, I still not as much, but I took so much shit. Oh yeah. So much shit. You gotta. So much shit. They're like, you mean you like the body is a wonderland guy? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, it's not about that though. And they're like, you like daughters. You like buys one. I'm like, Okay. I like, love daughters. That's one of my favorite dudes. I love daughters. And yeah. here's the thing about daughters, which this irritates me so much. People listen to that and they're like, oh, it's just a sweet song. It's a heartbreaking song. Okay. That song is fathers love your daughters because if you don't, they're not going to love and trust men. Yeah. <laughs> which is like, it's fucked up to say it, but that's what the song is about. Mm-hmm. And he's gone on record and he says, like, I really love this girl. And I tried to make it work. But the first guy in her life who was ever really supposed to love her was her father. And he bailed on her. And she just never really trusted and could never open up. And he's like, I, you know, fathers of your daughters because I can't help this girl. Yeah. You know? Which is like, damn. That's, and everyone's like, but it's this sweet song. And then mothers and fathers is like, okay, you know, believe what you want, whatever. And yeah. but Wonderland, yeah, yeah. I'll give that to you guys. Like, yeah, it's a bubblegum pop song. Like, I totally get it. You know, that's fine. But, but also, once you learn guitar and you learn your body is in Wonderland, that song oh, is a girl. key. Yeah, it, it is. Oh, it it, it makes itself so worth it to you. Uh. It, yeah, I'm like, and that's just so funny because every guy's like, that song's just dumb. That's for girls. I'm like, yeah, watch this. You start playing, and all yeah. the girls, oh my God. I'm looking, I'm like, well, yeah, look what I can do. Yeah. And it's oh, not that's so be that guy. But like, you know, yeah. it's not be that guy. So, you know, they're gonna throw that song at you as as their defense. You can yeah. jujitsu that move right on them. You know, yeah. use their weight against them and uh, throw it back in their face. Oh, 100 percent. Okay, so yeah, so I'm following John there. You know, mm-hmm. going to high school. So I think 2000 would have been 11 or 12 is when he had the Granny Loma, and he. But also, like there was 2009 or 10. Like, you know, Mayor had a, some really rough interviews, and yeah, know, I've had this conversation with people. I'm like, yeah, and. I watched him do an interview with Kerwin Frost uh, maybe a month or two ago. And John was like, you have to understand something. When I was growing up, I knew what I wanted to do at a very young age. And I had my parents who were professional educators. I had my friend's parents. I had everyone saying, you're never going to make it. You Mm -hmm. will never be anything. You were going to live in Fairfield, Connecticut, and you're going to work at a gas station and be absolutely nothing. Not only did John get into Berkeley College of Music, which is a prestigious music school in Boston, and he left after a semester, went down to, um, where'd he go? 
think Georgia. Atlanta. Yeah, yeah he went Atlanta. down to Georgia, and he, and, he, and he hooked up with Buddy from uh, George Brown Band. They had a duel. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So he and Clay Cook went down and started making yeah. music, and then they just kind of did their own thing. And John was like, "Well, I'm down in Atlanta, and I have." Well, he basically had the beginning of Room for Squares, like the album done. Like he mm-hmm. had all those songs, he just had to perfect it. But you know, so he grew up. No one believed in him. Everybody gave him shit. Mm-hmm. So I think to be 24 20, or whatever, we'll say by 25, Daughters is out. You already have a Grammy from Buyers Wine and Land. I think he won. So at this point, he's like won four Grammys or whatever. Yeah. And I get being kind of an asshole. And it's it's like, I don't excuse it, but I get it because everyone's like, you'll never be. And then they're like, oh, hey, by the way, congratulations. He's like, no, mm-hmm. you don't get it. Like, I'm more than this. So like, you're you're doing great, John, but like when are you gonna fail? So he he just felt like no one believed in him. And when he did it, he was like, fuck you, I did it. Yeah. Like but, but then, it, but then also I think I think I think there's also another side of that because that was same thing for for me. I feel like when I was really getting falling head over heels and like going in ride or die for John Mayer, it was right around those times where those those interviews were coming out and he's putting himself in that bad light. And yeah. for somebody like myself that was just diving all the way into who he is and getting, you know, watching all the interviews, watching all the stuff, and you could tell. For me, what I what I saw out of it is definitely all that is true. But I also think it was this guy who's a savant, right? And he is just oh so good in this one area of life, but then also just socially was lacking in some areas, right? And yeah. didn't know well, it didn't come natural to him. So what he was doing was taking on the persona, and what was he becoming a rock star? So he took on that rock star persona and was just giving people. So when he would go into these interviews. I have to put out, turn on my rock star right now. And for somebody yeah. that, you know, and, and you can, and then when you go back and watch those interviews from that perspective of, okay, this is a, you know, uh, an amazing savant in an uncomfortable situation, trying to give these reporters what they want. And that's exactly what it is. Right. And he, the way he was talking about girls in a way he was trying to be a rock star and that's just, you know, he's his own, he is a rock star in his own version. But now when you see yeah. him like with his uh, current moods and all that, oh, you yeah. get to see him be exactly who he is and you go, Oh, that's the guy. And you'd see little pieces that break through, but it was always, hidden within he was hiding that within this rock star persona right and, and you know talking about all the girls he sleeps with and all this stuff and yeah. it just came off so disingenuous and so oh, awful really everyone's like "Ooh, what is this and, and and but you see that as the natural progression of somebody that comes in that young with all those factors that we just talked about plus all the people telling him you're never going to be shit you're not all exactly. that comes together and then you see what that turns into and then all he sees is the negative reaction. This he goes, you know what? Like, hey, I was just trying to give you guys what you want. Like, if this is what's going to be, I'm just going to go off to Montana and be on my own. You know what I mean? Which was amazing. No one saw coming, and that's the thing. So I remember again, like 2009. I'm I've been with John for years now. You know, and right, I, I right. didn't see him until Search Revving Tour, which I just I don't know why. Like, I was I never got around to seeing him when I was younger. Mm-hmm. But so and we'll we'll get there. So yeah, the interviews come out, and John's basically like he deletes Twitter. I remember driving to school that day and it was just like, in other news, John Mayer, shock jock, has deleted Twitter. Probably a good move for him. And like, no one heard a fucking word of him for like two and a half to three years. He went to Electric Lady Studio in New York City. He was, and he wrote Born and Raised or, yeah, he wrote Born and Raised. Is that what the album called? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, he wrote Born and Raised. And everyone was just kind of like, this is not John Mayer. And I got to say, and you know, no cap or whatever. Like I first was like, this is not John. And it took me a little while to get out. I still liked it, but I was like, all right, this is different. And now if I listen to anything off that record, I'm like, this is so good. Yeah. And, and, that, and that was funny for me too, because I was coming in where John Mayer was this huge departure from what I, cause I was country, you know, like I grew up in slavery, oh, yeah. like Alberta country all the way, all my, th- you know, when I first learned guitar, it was to learn country songs. Right. And yeah, you know, yeah. Completely. full on country. And then I fell into John Mayer and just loved him because for what he was and just his sound and, you know, yeah. trying to even say what John Mayer was prior to born and raised when he kind of born and raised was the first time there was any kind of genre attached to his music. Because like when you listen to his albums, he has so much oh. range throughout them, but then he just puts out this album that nobody saw, see, nobody saw coming. That was so within my realm of what I was already about. And then he just happened to come in. Like, it was like, he came into my world to be like, Oh, you like country let me show you what the the real boundaries of what country can be. Right. And I'm going to take my crack at it. So for me, as like, I was like, Oh my God, this is like, I'm just the luckiest kid ever. Like who that's, like, that's awesome. Oh, that was awesome. Here's what I know. I've had this conversation with people before I've talked to Nick about this. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I think if you look and you said it perfectly, like, you know, he didn't really fall into a genre. You have this guy who is so hyper musical and like, and another thing and I'm for anyone listening I will fight you tooth and nail if you disagree with me that John Mayer is not one of the greatest guitar players alive. I, he, I would say living and dead. I think because I think he is. And like, and that's another problem. People don't realize that. So 
and I think a lot of it, he had so much success with like very pop songs like Buyers and Wonderland and Daughters. Like, yeah, any guy can go on, you know, Ultimate Guitar and learn those songs. Yeah, that's true. That's mm-hmm. true. But, you know, if you really want to listen to, I think, mm-hmm. if you're looking for my top picks, Best Buys in Wonderland, go to any given Thursday, Bodies in Wonderland. It's like eight minutes long and the acoustic solo in there is insane. It'll blow your mind. But yeah. so if I had to rank this through, I talked to Nick once and I was like, every album, I think up until kind of what he's doing now, was its own weird little genre. So if you look at Room for Squares, pop. You look mm-hmm. at heavy things, kind of alternative. Yeah. It's a, it's a little more, you turn your brain on. You look at Continuum, that's bluesy, kind of like rock all the way. Mm-hmm. You look at Battle Studies, was kind of a mix between like alt, alt rock, I'd say. Yeah. And then you get to Born and Rage, like this is folk. Kind of yeah, folk. folk. I shouldn't even call it country. Folk is a much better description. Folk, but like it is, like it is. Yeah. Like, I had people that like, this isn't real country. And I was like, this is probably like the rooted, like rootiest, like real country yeah. around right now. Like, you Especially look- with what country was, ha- what was happening in the country genre at that time where it was going yeah. so far away from what it used to be. Right. And I, I love old country and like, too. New country, I can listen to some of it, but like I cosmetic country, that's kind of where I go to it. I'm like, yeah. it's like pop country. Like, you know, I'm not a big Florida girls line guy. Like, I, yeah. I, every I, once in a while, a song breaks through from country. Like, and then this is coming from somebody that was, 100% diehard country fan. Yeah. The stuff that comes out lately, you know, every once in a while, something will break through that is like, oh, that's a pretty good tune. I might, I might, I might like that one, but yeah. I am so far away from it because 99% of the stuff coming out is just, it's, 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 you yeah. know, hits one. It's, it's, yeah, it's the it same really, as it, everything else. It, yeah. So it's like when everyone's the same, no one's special kind of deal, which mm-hmm. is weird. But I remember when Born and Raised came out, I'm like, this is so different. This is so not the John that I grew up with. This is not me, like six year old me is like, I don't, I don't have a song in this until yeah. a few years ago. It's like, if I ever get around to living, that song will forever be a, like just so important. I think to anybody who's a John Mayer fan, if you hear that song, cause it's built in phases and he's even taught, he's like, you know, phase one he's like, if I ever get around to living, you know, all these things phase two, he's just kind of reflective. Like and there's different breaks in the song. It's like three different songs rolled into one. And the end of it yeah. is just, you're in your mind you know, when are you going to wise up? You got to relax, enjoy your life. You know, living starts now. You're like, it's fucking awesome. Like, yes. And there's so many things like that too. And again, so many people like give me shit. They're like, but you know, we got the afternoon. We got this room for two. I'm like, yeah, I know he wrote that song and he made a million dollars. Like let him do his thing. Listen to this. Like, what are you, what are you looking for? And he's been pigeonholed as this womanizing douchebag who writes pop songs, which yeah. I just, I hate that narrative oh, so much. Nothing makes me angrier than having that conversation. And I'm sure me and you have both had that fight oh, with people to okay. show exactly what he is. And it's like, on what grounds do you want to argue this? Because you're saying he's this. I'm saying, yeah, he is that. But he's also one of the greatest guitar players to ever exist. He's also, you know, one of the most creative and just artistic oh, absolutely. people, right? Like he just, in so many, I could argue what you're trying to pigeonhole him into in so many different ways. It's like, it's like, here, pick my weapon that I want to use to beat you with right now, because I can beat you in this conversation any which way. And I'm the same way. Like if anybody tries to argue that John Mayer is anything less than, you know, the pinnacle of, of music, yeah. I will have that argument with you, right? It, whether you want to or not, we will have that argument. Oh, I, I've had that fight. I've Oh, me too. All the time. I, I, and here's, here's the real, here's the funny thing. And like, I don't yeah. want to really get into this, but like, I mean, we got to do it. The T Swift fans oh. fucking, fucking hate him so much. And like, i've i've dated girls who were like loved taylor swift and i was like i was like that's cool i love john mayer they're like we're gonna have problems here i'm like are you serious yeah why why can't we respectively just both love our musicians and artists like you know taylor swift's incredible she's talented it's taylor swift you know taylor swift's done some amazing things do i think she's a phenomenal guitar player no but i think she's a great songwriter i would never take that away from her let let you have that that's fine and i and then if you come at me, you're like, well, John's a douche. John's a dick. John can't do anything right. John, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, seven Grammys. Okay. <laughs> Just start right there. That's seven Grammys. Okay. Yeah. Well, t- if that's how you want to measure success, seven Grammys. Um, if you, <laughs> do you remember the 2000s at all? Yeah, they were, you're welcome, John Mayer. John Mayer made your 2000s success from 2001 to like 2010. John Mayer crushed it. Yeah. Which, and I think it's so insane. If you look at that, you're like, how does that happen? How, mm-hmm how do you have somebody just ring the bell for like a decade that young? And they're just, they're just what they're doing. But to be nonstop fans, hits. Yeah. Nonstop hits. Like, honestly, it was insane. You don't see that, but Taylor Swift fans hate him. Mm-hmm. So much. I've never met a fan base that like hates him more than anything else in this world. 
Right. And, and, and when you, and when you look at it, like, I almost have some question about what that relationship even was, like how, how even together they really were. Like, it wasn't very long. It wasn't really deep. They were both young at that time. Like for the reaction after the fact, I bet you, if you talk to John Mayer or Taylor Swift, they would both say the same thing of like the reaction in the public was so much greater than what the reality of that oh, was. Yeah. Like yeah. it, it, it's so silly, but yeah, I saw the same thing. And so much of that hate does stem from, from that one incident, but then, you know, and I think to be fair, our arguers on our side too, you know, John Mayer hasn't done himself favors at certain times throughout his career of adding to this, right. And things he's done and things he said. And yeah. I think when you real, when you, when you're as ride or die as me, you are, you can see where that comes from and, and, and that it's, in no means is he trying to be malicious in any of these areas. He's just trying to navigate. He's a, he's an artistic kid that was thrown into yeah. this rock star role and, and, yeah. and, and is trying his best to figure it out. And they all, like every time somebody has an argument, they'll go back. They have to go back like 10 years to say, Oh, this is who John Mayer was. It's like, have you seen who he is in the last 10 years and how funny and, and bubbly and light he is. And, yeah. and like, it's like, are you the same person you were 10 years ago? Exactly. No. Yeah. And that's, I mean that really every time I get in this argument, and, and I know I win this argument every time because I've had it many times. And I know deep, I, deep in John Mayer. I know the guy's life. I know what I, what he's done musically. I know what he's done planned to be like, he's a good dude. And yeah, he had a, a rough few years. We all do. That happens. And, you know, everybody always comes back to the 2009 Playboy interview. That's always the thing that comes back. Always. To me. Like, how do you defend that? And you did a perfect. I'm like, you have a guy who is giving these interviews because he, this is what is expected of him. Cause that's just, that's where he was. And then he was just like, that's the miscalculation. He's like, you know, he's like, well, this is a Rolling Stones interview. So you have to give a Rolling Stones interview. That's, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a misconception. And he even was like, if you don't want me to be this guy, stop trying to make me this guy. Like, I thought this is what you wanted. Mm -hmm. like, oh no, 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 John. We want you to be, you know, any other version of yourself, which I have to imagine was just so upsetting for him. Yeah. And, you know, and I get it. Like, you know, he locked himself away. And then I heard him do an interview. I am trying to remember with who he did this with. I'll, I'll have to figure it out. But um, he was talking about how he'd be in New York working on Born and Raised. He'd go out, you know, drinking and he'd go home. And he's like, I would just get on Zillow or whatever. And I would just look at houses in Montana. Yeah. And he just was I like, I've seen that interview. Yeah. And he just was like, you know, I want to go there. He's like, in the places you would go to, if you could drive a car. But you can't because you've been drinking. He's like, you know, all the places you wish you could go. And then you wake up, you're like, oh, that was stupid. Like, why am I here? He's like, but he's like, you know, that's what he did. And he got away and he went and did some other stuff. And then, you know, I, I remember Born and Raised came out. He had his surgeries. And there was a real issue that he might not ever be John mm -hmm. Mayer because he, he had some problems with his throat. And I was like, this sucks. Like the man at that point was like maybe 35 ish. I don't know. Now he's 42, but not that that matters, but he was almost gone, like completely gone. And he removed himself, which if you look at now, it's just like, he's still around, but he's not, I mean, you know, we're waiting on a new album. I know it's done. He's teased it. It's like, yeah, oh, I know he keeps teasing it. I, like, I'm, in, I'm in a few Facebook John Mayer groups that just like fan stages like, and they keep like talking about it and throwing it out. Like it's Friday. It's going to be Friday. Friday. I, oh, and yeah. I fall for it every time I'm checking, you know, I'm on, I'm on Apple. Probably check it, the same, it all the time. We are probably in the same Facebook. Group. We probably are. Yeah. Oh. I should have searched your name in that before I hopped on this. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like John Mayer fans or something like that. Yeah. 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 But oh, that's so funny. You know, he's he's done all these things, but he removed himself and he came back and, you know, searched for everything, I think was like his first real attempt being like, I'm back because, yeah. you know, born and raised, he didn't get the tour on it. And then there was Paradise Valley, which is an awesome record. I mean, I I'm I'm biased, but you put Paradise Valley on. If I hear Dear Marie or Wait on the Day, like I'm just I'm just chilling. You know, that's like that's the album. It's like you listen to you're like, I'm going to have this someday. I will have this. And in Dear Marie, there's a line like, you know, I go searching for a photograph online, but some county judge in Ohio's all I'll no, ever find. I've, oh. I've seen him twice in Ohio. When he sings that song, everyone loses their fucking shit. Like, I bet. Hey, Ohio, like, where's Marie? Is she here? Like, it's so yeah. funny. But that's, and then uh. Sir Trevin came out. And then it's been years. Like, there was a long time. I was in high school when Paradise Valley came out. I was like, when's the next album? When's the next album? And it went from, I think, 2013 to 2017 yeah was uh search for everything which is just this kind of amalgam like i don't know what the right word is it's everything that he's done put into one record like yeah and i can listen i'm like 
that's some heavier things vibes right there. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, yeah, there's, there's some some, battle studies, yeah. There's, there's some, some yeah, studies, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some there's some continuum and like and it's a great record and that tour is. was amazing. So I'm excited for what's coming. And you know, but I feel I feel like what what is so cool for me as a fan is to see it felt like for years he was always he always put out kind of what he wanted to do but he like he knew it's almost like he knew he could do anything and he was saying to like what do you guys want I can do yeah. I can be whoever you want me to be I am that talent right and I, and I don't know if he had articulated that way in his mind but I think he on some level knew that so you know, like, oh, you want me to be this pop star? I can put that album. Oh, you want me to be this? You want me to be this? And it seemed like that's what the first couple albums and it was less so every time that and more so, okay, I'm going to give you what you want, but also a piece of me. And then they kind of slowly towards like the later albums. Like I think really uh, with, uh, what's the last one? Uh, Search for Everything. Yeah, it's It seemed like that one was so much to me, nothing for everyone else and just for him. I, I mean, I'm putting, I'm putting, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth. Maybe he thinks completely different. That was the one he did for other people the most. But to me, as a fan, it seems like that was him just finally shedding all the last remnants of that bullshit that he dealt with for years and years and years. Yeah. And just being, hey, this is the album that I'm really proud of, and I really like. It. It's a bit odd. It's a bit different. It's, it's probably the biggest uh, shift. It's shift big- for, yeah, it was a, the biggest shift from his, from his other more like traditional albums at the start, especially right. Yeah. but it was so him and I loved it. And it was so cool to be able to see that. And it was like, Oh, I want more of this. Right. And yeah. I feel very similar about, I don't know how much you watch with current moods, right? This is, and for oh, people listening, I don't know what current moods is. Uh, he did this little Instagram show. He's not doing it anymore. Hey. Um, he hasn't for a while. Cause he, he said, I think he was talking to Andy Cohen. He was like, you know, I can put all my energy in a record or I can put all my energy in current mood. I cannot do both. And I think yeah. right now with the world, like I think my fans would probably rather have a record. It's been some time. I'm like, you're right, John. We want to. Yeah. 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 Okay. That, 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 that is fair. So, yeah, so what current moods was this, it was this show he did on Instagram live and he had, you know, like actually a lot of production value, really put some thought into it. And it was just his full artistic expression with no, nobody around to tell him what to do um, into the kind of his own little TV show. Right. Which was very cool. And it was cool as a fan to be able to see like, all these different pieces of who he is. Right. And I feel like that is what I want. Every time somebody brings up that, uh, that, that uh, article, I can't remember which one was the Rolling Stones article or whatever one got him in a bunch of trouble. They're kind of the last straw with people. Every time they bring that up, I want to bring up current mood to them and be like, Oh, this is who you think this person is. This is 100% exactly who he is with no other input, just him. And look how create. Yeah. And look how creative and light and, 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 and fun and, and, and go lucky it is. That's who this person is. And you're trying to pigeonhole him as, as this other thing. And then you can see that come through in his music and not to say that he isn't those other things, because I don't think he could make those songs that are that deep and like, like uh, just grab you like, and some of the bluesy ones that he has, I think he has that within him too. And most people have yeah very multifaceted different sides of them. But when you're going to try and hang your hat on that one piece of him, who he is, because he might not be that dark rock star. He, it's not to say that he's not that guy sometimes, but yeah. to try and say that's who he is the majority of the time when you can say like, no, at his base of who he is, this is probably the more natural him, right? Like, I feel like that was cool for me as a fan to watch uh, watch that. And then some of the, the guys he had on, like having, when he brought Dave Chappelle on and like yeah. uh, all these guys, it's like, oh my God, this is just like my favorite person just bringing on like other famous people that I get to see. And like, oh, so much fun to watch those. So here's a fun little, little story. I don't know if I ever told you this. So the first time I saw John was in Columbus. It would have been... April 12th, 2017. I remember that because it was two days before the full album of Search Revenue comes out. Okay. So, so Search Revenue tour, and it's awesome. So the way it was set up, it was like, you know, full band, solo acoustic, blues trio with Pino and Steve Jordan, which is John Mayer trio. Oh my God. Unreal. Oh. Fucking unreal. But then full band again, encore, and then epilogue. Now the epilogue was him in a little piano, and he was singing, you're going to live forever in me. So we're in Columbus. He's like, I'd like to welcome one of my dear friends up the stage, Mr. Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle comes up on stage, does like stand up. And it was like, before they started doing their control danger thing, where he yeah, and Dave, yeah. Chappelle, this was like the first time they ever did it. So I'm freaking out my breast. I'm like, oh my God, like Dave Chappelle, John Mayer. And they're talking about the Dave Chappelle show, how there's that John Mayer skit. It's like white people only dance the guitar. And they're, they're doing that. And it was the same day that Charlie Murphy had passed away, which is a oh, very yeah. good idea. It was like, and so everyone, you know, which is the normal, it's the unfortunate reality of, you know, the world we live in. Everyone pulls out their cell phone. They're like, oh my God, look at this. Like Instagram, Snapchat, Dave Chappelle. Yeah. So Dave's like, I understand you guys are really excited right now. This is a very sad day. I just lost one of my absolute best friends. And mm-hmm. it's like, now John was gracious enough to let me come on stage and talk to y'all and kind of, you know, shoot the shit. And 
couple months ago before that John had put that song. He's like, John played this song for myself, Charlie, and a few other people at Hotel Cafe in LA. He's like, so to honor Charlie Murphy, everyone put your phones down. We're going to make a memory here tonight and we're going to sing and we're gonna sing loud for Charlie and Murphy to hear in heaven. And everybody put their phone down. And, and it was one of the most surreal things. And we were just like, and people just started clapping. Everyone's like, yes, we're doing this. And Dave sat there and you could tell Dave was super emotional. John was yeah. really emotional. They got up, they hugged and they walked off stage. And it was just like, this is so, Holy man. it was, it was insane. And I remember being like, I don't know how, to end a John Mayer concert better than that. Yeah. I, 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 I really don't. And the, the other time I've been really lucky. I've been lucky every time I feel like I see him. So <laughs> there's always something when I see him, like, this is cool. I got to see it. And I saw him in Detroit later that summer on the summer, like end of the tour. Mm-hmm. And he played a uh, simple song, which I don't know if you've heard that song. I think I have. Yeah. yeah I don't know if there's a John Mayer song. I haven't heard, yeah, but I, I, that's not it, one of the ones it, I know too well. Yeah. And so it was a song John wrote for himself on his birthday. Did so on the Range Rover ads, like John Mayer goes outside, he plays it at the end. But if you look online, and so I'm listening, uh, simple song by John Mayer, you will find him playing it. Uh, it's September 1st, 2017 at Clarkston, Michigan. I was at that show. <laughs> Go watch the video. And it is insane. And it's a song he wrote for his birthday. He had teased it like just the first minute of it, like years ago at Hotel yeah. Cafe. And he's like, I'm going to play a song tonight and you guys won't know it, but I think you'll like it. So I wrote it on my birthday. I was like, simple song. And I mean, he was just like, what the? I'm like, everyone's <laughs> crazy. And I was singing and people were around like, how the fuck does this guy know this song? Yeah. My friend, if it's John Mary, he knows it like better than John does. Like, yeah, it was one of those cool things. So I've been lucky enough to see him do like these one of one things. So that, yeah. um, the Dave Chappelle thing, I had to see him do clarity when he was in Detroit and it was Jerry Garcia's birthday. So he played, um, a Grateful Dead song, Friend of the Devil, slow like version, which is so funny because I there were these younger girls behind my friend and I, like younger, like maybe a year or two younger than me. Yeah. Like, the entire time they were like, Daughters, Bodies of Wonderland, Gravity. And you know, he played like all of the songs. I'm like, God, I'm like they don't know the good ones. And so when the dead song came on, I just turned, I'm like, You guys know this? Like, did he write this? Is this new? I was like, This is Grateful Dead. And there's a huge picture of Jerry Garcia. Like, well, who's that bearded guy? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but that's the funny thing though, with him being dead and company, which I got to see him do dead and company. And that was, mm-hmm. that was me a trip. too. Yeah. Dead and co is a trip. Like yeah. he's up there and you can tell he is so fucking happy having the time of his life. Cause yeah. he's just, playing. and that was good too, because I think, you know, paradise Valley came out, he knew toured on it. I think it did pretty well, but, and he just was like, all right, well, I'm going to kind of hang out. And then he did the late, late show uh, before like Colbert took over. There's like a three day period where John Mayer was like late, late show. Yeah. And so he's always kind of had that in him. So I feel like current mood is like definitely a continuation of that. And I guess there's there's talks of him doing something else like that. I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. But, and then one of his last nights, Bob Weir showed up and they played Althea, the Grateful Dead version. So look that up. That's amazing. Late, late show. It's like John Mayer, Bob Weir, Althea. And John, you can tell he's like having a time in his life. Like, this is cool. And that kind of mm-hmm. got me into a little more of the dead. Fast forward a few years later, John's on stage, you know. And it's weird that he's kind of found this whole world. And I know people who love the dead, who hated John Mayer, and now they like John Mayer. I know yeah. people who are kind of like, I don't understand Grateful Dead. Listen, John Mayer. John Mayer joins. I'll give it a try. Then they That's won. me. Yeah. That's me. And, and yeah. they, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't get it. And then you get into it. Like, you know what? Even if I don't get it, that's okay because I love him and I love what he's doing. Mm-hmm. He's happy, and this is just a totally different vibe. I never saw mm-hmm. coming. Well, I didn't. In fact, not only did I not get it till John Mayer joined, I still didn't get it. So, at this time when they first toured uh, Dead and Company, I can't remember when it was. It's was probably ar- around that time. And uh, twenty sixteen, I think. Yeah, it's probably around yeah. twenty sixteen. That I had when I fell in love with John Mayer in you know twenty ten or whatever whatever yeah. it was at that time. You know, two thousand nine. Yeah. And I just never really got to see it. I never really got to see him tour. I always missed it. There was, you know, one thing or another and I, and I never got to see him. So then I found out that he was touring with, and I, and I told my family, I said, you know, if John Mayer goes on tour, even if it's a European tour, like I am going to where he is. So then they announced a tour with, with dead and company. And I'm like, ah, oh, well, you know, like I, I, 
I don't really know their music, but yeah. I've got to, I've got to see John Mayer play. So I'll, I'll look up some of their songs, but I look at their catalog and it's like a million songs. Long song. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm not going to be able to, you know, bring this all in, but I, I made yeah. the, just made the choice. So with the closest one, they weren't coming to Canada or that maybe they were coming to a couple of places, but just out East. So yeah. wouldn't be able to see him. So there is a show at the Gorge Amphitheater in Washington. You want so, all, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So drove all the way down to BC, uh, up in Canada. Right. Uh, and we, we have a, a campsite there, you know, met my family there and then drove down, went over the border, drove all the way down to there. And I didn't know about that amphitheater, what it was, yeah. what to expect. I didn't know what, you know, the dead and co show was going to be like. So we drive down me, my mom, my sister, my mom dropped us off at the, at the show. My sister's never, not a huge John Mayer fan, not a yeah. dead and dead and company fan, you know, just wanted to go because she wanted to support me. Right. Yeah. So we go there and we bought these tickets. We didn't know the the layer of the amphitheater and you know it's it's this amazing amazing uh natural structure and you're you're walking up and you're going through these parking lots and you come through these giant gates and you look down and it's just this rolling grass field then it turns to rock and then it turns to seats and then this big uh um stage set up and then behind that is the rolling ravines of, of 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 uh the gorges and just the sunset and just how beautiful this place was it was like oh my god this is the coolest thing i've ever seen regardless of about what i'm about to witness and yeah. we go down there and, and it turns out the seats that we bought, we didn't mean to do this, but they were like these box seats. I mean, it's an outdoor show. So it was just yeah, kind yeah, of a cordoned yeah, off yeah. area, but like wicked seats in terms of like where we got to go. And there was nobody around us. We had this whole space That's and, insane. oh, it was so cool. And then we get to see them perform and you get, to, and, and not only was it seeing the performance, but it was seeing the performance around, because I don't know if it, people know about the Grateful Dead and oh, yeah. who they were culturally, but to see these 80 year olds, 90 year olds, seven year olds, like dancing in a certain way and just like all the, the, the acid and all the stuff that was going on around me. And I'm there with my sister, right? Like I'm sober as a, yeah, as yeah. a, as a church nun at that point. Right. Not by choice. Maybe if somebody would have offered me something at that show, I would have done it, but. <laughs> oh yeah. I guess. Just, sorry, yeah. Oh, there you go. Right. Like, and it yeah. was, it was just so cool to see the experience of like, the music was amazing. The guitar, the instrumental, the, the songs that were playing was just, it grabbed you in that moment, but not only just the music, but the entire it's an experience. The experience of it just, it sucks you in. It was just like the coolest thing I've ever seen. And just like to they'll go on, you know, 20 minute guitar solos and just like, oh, yeah. just, just free flow, whatever it was. And to see them allow John into that world and to let him have his freedom to do his thing and to bring it oh. in and how well they meshed. It was just one of the coolest experiences I've ever seen. Like I just, I can picture it so well in my mind. I'm such a forgetful guy and I'm, I, I'm very bad at that. I feel like my mind goes at a million miles a minute all the time. It's hard for me to really lock moments in, but that show was just, Oh, I can't even tell you just how amazing it was. Like just to see that. I, I still have a hoodie that I bought there and it's one of my favorite ones. And I can't oh, wait dude, to go it, see him again. It, so yeah, when I saw John, you know, and that was my first time ever seeing John Mayer. What is the dead and go show? Okay. So it's, it's the same thing. I was like, I've never seen him. I'm going to go see him. And it was in Michigan with my buddy. I was like, yo, it's not going to be John Mayer's songs. It's going to be grateful dead. Are you in? He's like hundred percent. I'm like, cool. And at that point he had, he had put off the PRS super Eagle, which we're talking guitars, like two, to chase the rest of your life a super eagle is like top tier but a silver sky is like what you're gonna probably end up getting which yeah another guitar i'd love to have someday i'll get it one day but yeah that's in my head too even though i don't yeah. play electric guitar i'm still gonna buy it i'm so yeah so part of me was like this will be even for me because i'm a huge music nerd and guitar guy i'm like mm-hmm. just to see a super eagle in person not even a super eagle john's super eagle was insane i have a snapchat video i was like there it is people I'm like the prs super eagle is like oh one and people are like how do you, what is this? What I'm like, doesn't matter. You either love it or you don't. Yeah, but, yeah just keep going. Move just along. Keep going. But to your point, like I can say confidently, I have never been in a more unique concert in my life in terms of like, I've never felt more like safe, relaxed, and just like, fr- it was so free. And you're right. Yeah. You see people it there, like, like there was love coming out of everybody in that place. Like when I was it, there, it was the weirdest feeling. It really is. And it's like, I've never been around this many people in my life and just felt like completely like, at peace but also like so happy like i'm smiling i'm high five i'm yeah dancing. like you don't care you're just you're there to have fun and it's such a unique experience and i've been to so many concerts in my life and that one's and most of them are always like you know you're there you buy seats you don't see it. if you sit at concerts what the hell are you doing like unless it's you know classical or whatever that i understand but like i went and saw phil collins a few years ago i, I stood the entire time like you have to same with John. I'm standing the entire time. I bought seats. I don't care. You're standing in the dead show. Same thing. I bought seats, stood, dance, 
you know, I had people all around us smoking weed, doing stuff, you know, no, nothing was offered to me, which is fine. It didn't matter. I was probably pretty stoned off contact high. Like it was, <laughs> there's one part during every Grateful Dead show where they do a thing called drums in space, which is very like experimental, like, you know, Mickey Hart and uh, Bill Kreutzman, the drummers, the Grateful Dead, the original drummers, they're still alive and they still play, which is awesome. They just kind of do their own thing. They just jam up there. They're playing like bongos, they're playing drums, they're hitting all kinds of things. They have little car horns. It's weird. It's fun. And then, you know, that's kind of like the coffee break where John and Bob and, you know, everybody else gets off stage. They, you know, eat real quick or whatever, come back on stage. Because for anyone who doesn't know, a Grateful Dead show lasts a long time. Mm -hmm. And like a certain song, like Eyes of the World on like a CD is probably like a six minute song. Eyes of the World on a Grateful Dead show can be a 16 minute song without breaking a sweat. Yeah. But you don't care because you're like, this is so fun. And the transitions to these songs, like they just flow. It's co- so colorful. It's so mm-hmm. fun. And, you know, even if you don't like The Grateful Dead, I'd say go to one of these shows if you can, because the experience alone, you'll never yeah. forget it. Hundred percent. That that's exactly what I was gonna say, and that's what we were saying because my mom dropped us off at the show, and she's like, "I'm not gonna say." It. And it's like, "Oh, I wish you would have just come just to experience the experience yeah. of what that was like." But but we didn't know, right? And, and also with that app, like I've said now, like since then, I would I've been just trying to find the right person in the right show to get back to that Gorge Amphitheater because just the venue itself was so beautiful and so work. so breathtaking, like that alone would be worth it. If you've had any sort of concert you want, want to go to, let alone if it was seeing one of your favorite people of all time play for yeah. the first time live, right? Like right in front of you like that. It was just such a cool experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what an experience that is too. I feel like, so that was both our first time seeing John then was yeah. at a show, show. And mm-hmm. I can confidently say like, it was everything I wanted it to be. Yeah. And, and in its own way, I'm kind of glad that was my first experience because he was allowed to do whatever he wanted on a guitar. And yeah, Nothing makes John happier than doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was, that was the thing. It yeah. looked like he was just having so much. Yeah. That I'm so glad you stumbled or brought that yeah. point up because yeah. it was that freedom, right. Of just the songs can be as long or as short as they want. And just the jam and just to, you know, play around. And and I think it was at one point, my sister, like, are they still playing this song? And it was like 15 minutes, but I was like, yeah, I didn't even notice. Right. Like you're just so yeah. locked into what they're doing and that they're so locked into what they're doing on stage. And you're just right in it with them. That I didn't even know that they were playing the same song for 15 minutes right like that it's just normal like it's just yeah oh yeah didn't seem out of place for a second and like you pick it up really quick you're like oh this is what's happening and then you're like oh yeah this is what's happening yeah exactly yeah and you and you don't care you're like this yeah. is so fucking cool like i love the fact that i am standing here grooving out with people who are old enough to be my parents and my grandparents and we're all on yeah. this like and that's the thing about a grateful dead show i feel like you can pay as much as you want you know, to be as close as you want, mm-hmm. it does not matter. And then at any other concert, that would matter because it's like you're that close. At the Grateful Dead show, everybody's equal. I don't care where you are, you are in the back, you're in the front, you're in the middle. Everybody's there for the same reason. They're there to have a good time, listen to music, and just vibe out. And it is yeah. it is such a unique experience. And what? again, like I just don't think any other concert that I've been to, I mean. I, I I love John's shows. Don't get me wrong. I think they're phenomenal. They're well mm-hmm. done and his band's amazing, but it's still, it is very much like this is a concert, you know, that you're going to like, you know, production bad. It's very typical that most mm-hmm. people concerts, but a dead show is just something that's like, it's one of a kind. Yeah. You got it. You have to experience it to be yeah. able to, uh, to understand it. Um, you said you, you, you go to a lot, a lot of concerts. What would be the best non John Mayer show you've ever seen? Oh, best non John Mayer show. Okay. Um, probably this would be it's sort of a couple of years ago actually i got like a snapshot memory the other day it's like this was three years ago i'm like damn it's crazy so do you, are you familiar with tom mish tom mish i don't think i am okay i feel like well, i will be shortly after this uh this yes. interview ends yeah um so tom mish is uh he's my age which is hilarious because it's this guy who i stumbled into him on high school you ever heard of like majestic casual it's on youtube yeah i think so Could yeah, I mean, yeah it's it's a lot. I don't know who's in charge of it, but it's like people will take certain songs and they'll remix them to be like very chill. It's like a mm-hmm. whole, like, you know, if driving around late at night and, you know, having deep conversations with a playlist, this is what it would be. Yeah. So I'm just casual. So I found this song follow in like 2013, which is Tom Mish and his sister, Laura, who plays saxophone. So part of me was like saxophone. I play saxophone. Yeah, you're I'm in. In on this. And so it's this uh, English guy who is my age, but at the time he was, yeah, he would have been in high school. So maybe like 18 putting these songs out. And he was one of the first guys, like 
Like SoundCloud's been around for a long time. I don't think there's anybody who's more successful at SoundCloud than Tom Mish because he was mm-hmm. putting out songs like daily and they were just like instrumental hip hop beats or they were just him playing guitar or like these jazz fusion things. And it was like, oh, this is just really, really chill, kind of relaxing music. So, you know, he put out his first EP, I think in 2016, it's four songs. I have it on vinyl because I love it. And, you know, I went so, but he's from, you know, England. So, you know, yeah. which is one of those weird things. Like if you're small band, you don't travel a lot anyways, even if you're in the United States, if you're from England, like there's really not a whole lot of chance that you're going to come to a place, you know, unless it's like a really big city. I'm thinking like, all right, like LA or whatever. So, so he put out his first album geography in 2018 and he put out tickets he was like yeah i'm gonna be in detroit and i was like okay i live in michigan i can do detroit it was in mexican town in detroit and this tiny little venue so we show up my buddy and i show up and it was the same day that avengers infinity war came out so i remember that because we went and saw infinity war later that night which is crazy yeah. it was an awesome day so we went and saw so there's another band who opened up for him. And I was actually talking to the opening band, not knowing it because I'm just hanging out outside. Yeah. So another band I'd recommend checking out Hablo Brown, Hablo Brown. Hablo Brown. Yeah. They're from California. Very chill, kind of same vibe as mm-hmm. Tom. So they opened up and I'd never heard of these guys. They opened up and I was like, okay, this is cool. And then the John Mayer thing, they play level, which is like a John Mayer demo that never really went anywhere. But well, they started playing it. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, level. And the guy's like, who the fuck said that? I'm like, me. He's like, how do you? I'm like, keep going. And so I was happy about it because, you know, John Mayer nut. Yeah. So they play that. They did their set. And the tickets were 15 bucks. I was like maybe seven feet away from Tom and his band. Wow. And he is phenomenal. Like, I would go John Mayer, then Tom Mish. Like, in my. Wow. Like mm. in my favorites, like it would go Tom Mish next. So that's high praise coming from you. Yeah. And so he's, he's just hyper musical. And if you dig into his stuff, like if you go on YouTube, there's a thing called race against the clock. He did this interview. He had 10 minutes to put a song together. Yeah. And it's insane. <laughs> and he built this whole song in 10 minutes. I'm like there are people who can spend 10 hours, like a year plus, and they would come nowhere near this. It took him 10 minutes and he just did it flawlessly. Cause that's yeah. the way his mind works. He's like, I just make beats, man. I just hang out. So he did that show and it was phenomenal. I went and saw Avengers infinity war later that night. Like, it was just a really memorable day, but like for the price point for the experience and his band is so phenomenal. It's just like some of his best friends, but they're so good. And Tom himself is just very, he's like a jazz musician on a guitar, but his guitar is a 2003 John Mayer Fender Stratocaster. There you go. There and, you I, go. It was, it's, and I knew that's what he had. So hearing one of those live, I'm like, all right, like it's got those big dipper pickups. That's what we all are after. Like, yeah, it's awesome. And so, and he, John Mayer's a huge influence in his life and a huge, you know, he's a huge fan of. Fast yeah. forward two years later, like about a year ago, um, he was down in, you ever, you've seen the Crossroads festivals, right? Yeah. The area, so, Tom mm-hmm. got to play at that. John Mayer hopped up on stage and played with Tom. Wow. So like that's like the fully realized dream. It's like, yeah, it has come full circle. So I've watched this kid who's my age just put music out on SoundCloud. And he started his own record label out of his bedroom. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. He, yeah. And he just was like, I'm going to do it. And he yeah. did it. And so John sent him a silver sky and he did a tiny desk concert on NPR um, a little, a few months ago, like a COVID edition. So he's at home. Yeah you know there's a guitar solo at the very end john mayer shows up there's a guitar solo he's like hey, john mayer like and he like it's just uh. crazy how this works so part of me is like yes tom mish because there's a john mayer connection but hyper musical super chill music like you've, you've actually if you've watched my instagram lives you've seen me play so i probably stuff. have yeah but i'm sure i I'm, have yeah. i'm sure you have so i would say probably one of the best concerts next to a john concert i mean who else have i seen i had to pull up my phone here real quick yeah. I've seen, oh God, I've seen so many people. Well, there's one I, I know I got to ask you about because this is another one of our, uh, both of our faves, but uh, another UK legend that took the world by storm, Ed Sheeran. Uh, oh yeah. When did, when did you first find him? Because I know for me, when I, I found him when he was uh, quite small, right? And I remember when he came yeah. and opened up for Taylor Swift, going to that concert, uh, 
with my girlfriend at the time who was a huge Taylor Swift fan. I was not a big Taylor Swift fan and I felt bad about this, but like pretty much went entirely just to see Ed Sheeran open. And we had these amazing seats like right by the stage and yeah. the way, uh, all the way, I was so disappointed about this because we're right by the front of like her stage kind of came out and then there was more people on the inside of it. But when Ed Sheeran came out, he just stayed at the back and didn't come out there, but we would have been like, yeah, 20 feet away from him, but just yeah. to see him come out with just his loop pedal. Yeah. Cause when I'd watch him play, I was, I was just a huge fan of watching him on YouTube and just watching him mess around live and stuff, which is so yeah. cool. And to see him come out with just that loop pedal and his guitar and make the most amazing music of all time that I was just sitting there throughout the entire Taylor Swift concert, just absolutely buzzing for what I just saw from Ed Sheeran. And then eventually I got to see him when he came back and see a full concert of him. And it's just, that is one of those things where everybody needs to experience it. Everyone, what everyone hears of Ed Sheeran on the radio versus of what Ed Sheeran can do live, even just to go on YouTube and watch how he does it. You will have such a different appreciation for what that, what a talent he is and what a cool dude he is. Like, fuck, I just can't, uh, I don't know. I feel like I don't have the words to explain to people just what a, sensation that guy is so i i unfortunately i was gonna see him when multiply came out in 2013 15 one of those i don't know yeah around so like he came up like i was like i had to work or i was traveling or like i couldn't make it work i'm like damn but he was in detroit and he came out wearing a detroit red wings jersey because he played a joe lewis or it's like yes yeah. so i got on ed sheeran um i would have been when did a team come out i know that's like the hit but like a team came out but it like it did well, but like it grew. Like when it first yeah. came, we were like, "Who's this guy?" So I remember when eighteen came out, I was like, "Oh my god, this song is hauntingly beautiful." Like yeah. you listen to it, and it's just like this is just this is really good. And then you know, I picked up I think Edition, which is the first album, mm-hmm. and like he got Lego House, you got a little bump. Mm-hmm. You, know, mm-hmm. you, I don't know, you have all these oh. really great songs, and you're like, who is this guy? Yeah. Where, like, he's got to be big somewhere you're like oh it's ed sheeran and like he just came out of nowhere and you're like okay yes this is amazing and again it was and i hate the thing and i'm sure this has happened to you and anybody who like when you find somebody musically that you're like really proud of and you're like please listen to this and your friends want nothing to do with it yeah. and like, wait and like oh have you ever heard the song don't or you know like uh oh this song like I showed it's the same guy. Yeah, it's yeah. The same I, guy. I showed you him three years ago. I showed you him. You like, and you hate to be that guy. And it's not like I'm like I found Ed Sheeran. No, like, I'm. There's no part of me is like I was the first guy to discover the fire that is the Ginger Fury, as yeah. Noel Gallagher will call him from Oasis. But to your point, an acoustic guitar and a looper pedal, and you're like, well, that's the whole show. Yeah, and it's it's an insane. Like Google some of his shows and. And if you can be that talented with just that minimalistic, like I would love, I would absolutely love to see what he could do with a full band if he had one. But does he yeah. need it? Absolutely not. And if you're an Ed Sheeran fan, you're totally in on what he is. You're like, he's no bullshit. It's this guy yeah. who really wanted to do this. And I remember the reading the story, like the song, You Need Me, man. Like, you need me, I don't need you. Yeah. The record labels were like, you know, yeah, we like you and all, but we think you should dye your hair because, you know, you know, you're kind yeah. of the whole ginger thing. We don't think it's going to work well and maybe cover up some of your tattoos. And he was like, fuck you. You need me. I don't yeah. need you. He's like, you're coming to me for these songs. And it's not like even a cocky way. It's like, mm-hmm. no, I'm not going to compromise who I am just to get a song. Yeah. And he's like, I'll walk away from this. I don't care. And then he puts that song. And you're like, this is just awesome. Like he's I think he's a very, very good songwriter. Um. I think Ed Sheeran owns the throne on wedding songs. <laughs> Any wedding I've ever been to, it's like uh, you now gotta have I'm, a little bit of Ed Sheeran. And then, I mean, it's like now having the first dance, and it's always just you know, uh, what song? I've heard so many. Ed yeah, I, I know, uh, I know exactly what song it's, but it's yeah, you know not coming. To, I, it's not coming perfect, to me either. Perfect. Back then. perfect. Yeah. Oh, you look perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't deserve. Yeah, it's perfect. But and and. and to hear that he had, yeah, just come over to America just to start playing. He was in LA just playing gigs and finding people in the crowd to stay on their couches that night. Eventually, Jamie Foxx sees him, goes, yeah. who the fuck are you? Come to my house, play for all these rich people. You stay at my house. So he's staying at Jamie Foxx's house for a couple of weeks and plays for all these people, makes all these connections, and is just strapped to a rocket ship from that moment. And just to see oh, someone yeah. that has 
all this talent and just knows that, right? And he's telling record labels, you know, this is, I'm very similar to the John Mayer, like, oh, I believe in what I'm going to be one day. And I absolutely have to. I think if you're going to be in that industry and if you're going to do it, you, there's no half ends. You have to believe, you have to trust yourself in the art you're making. You have to believe 100%, like, this is me and I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. If, you, if there's room for too much doubt, I think you're going to like listen to the wrong people or, and you see that, unfortunately, like, you see musicians and artists who do that. And I'm trying to think of like just some people you're like, when's the last time you heard a song from this person? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, well, they, well, they're doing this now. Well, what the, what, what the fuck? Like, yeah. yeah like, and it's weird. Like, okay. Like an example today, like I was listening to some smash mouth today, you know, smash mouth's got some awesome hits. Yeah. Like the late nineties, early two thousands. Great. But it's, I think they were a fun band. I think they could have made some more hits. I don't know. Are you listening to all, like nineties? Like nineties are so prime for like the one hit wonders or like, mm-hmm. 90s was just such a tight niche pocket of just like bands like Sugar Ray, Smash Mouth, and you know Uncle Crab, like all these guys, and like, and they still tour and they do those songs, and everyone's like, "That's a great song. I forgot about that song." Yeah. Like, what happened to Matchbox Twenty? Like, they're still awesome bands and relevant in their own way, but like, you know, they just, I don't know. I feel like along the way, you either completely believe yourself, like I'm gonna keep going, or you're just kind of like, yeah, you know, maybe I'm. Yeah. Take a, like, but no, Ed Sheeran's one of those guys for sure that was like. I'm going to fucking do it. Yeah. And and I think it's one thing when it's a guy like Ed Sheeran or a guy like John Mayer where it's them and it doesn't require all these other things. Whereas, you know, when it's a band, it's a little bit different. There's so much that needs to go right. And so much, everything needs to catch fire at the same time all together and, and, and come together. And then that's a, a bright flame to hold together all those pieces yeah. where, you know, like when it's somebody like John Mayer, it's John Mayer versus John Mayer. Can he hold himself? And you know what? You could yeah. probably make a strong argument that he almost tore himself apart in those areas where we saw, but luckily enough for us as fans, yeah. he figured that out and kind of was able to take a, a step away far enough away from the industry that was tearing him to pieces to, to remember who am I like, fuck, like, yeah. Wh- where was that guy from Fairfield, Connecticut? Right. Like let's find him again. And he did yeah. and was able to now come back and put out amazing music since then. And it's just so cool to see, but that's lucky that happened because it very easily could have went the other way where John Mayer could have, you know, Fallen deeper into that hype, got into that thing, got into some bad things with some wrong yeah. people around him, and we could have not had what John Mayer is today, right? And he could have been uh, a completely different story. Oh, I mean, and that's that's a question I've had this argument with. And you're a guitar player, you're like this, okay? So let's talk. Let's talk Hendrix for a second, because I mm. like this, this hypothetical question I I've had with people. It's like, if Jimi Hendrix had not passed away at 27 years old, would Jimi Hendrix continue to have been Hendrix, or is Hendrix only so like immortalized because you know he did so amazing and then he passed away. i've seen people say jimmy hendrix would have if he hadn't you know died would have just kept making hit after hit and would just be still kicking and would just be this guy who was been around and was like this is the fucking man i've also seen people say hendrix is probably had he lived he would have been really good and burnt out and then he'd be on the side of a vegas road just playing a 12 string fucking around yeah and 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 i feel like i could make an argument for either side because i do see that of like almost somebody to reach those heights, especially at that time where nobody had been there before. And he was oh, just yeah. blazing trail for all these other people. But I feel like sometimes when you burn that bright, you burn out, right? Like you only, you, you just, uh, you know, like say that, right? Like you just, you give everything you can concentrate in this couple of years and that's everything. And it's poof, it's gone. Right. And that's, that's one argument, but then there's also this argument for those people. Right. And I feel like that you could maybe make that argument for what John, no, I feel like John Mayer's a little bit different. I feel like he always was kind of finding his uh, thing, but, but then I see the argument for this too, because I was actually thinking about this this morning, knowing we're going to have this conversation of what is so cool is watching John Mayer and seeing that you could have seen this 20 years ago that he is a, I think it was harder because of the type of music he was, he was doing, yeah. wasn't le- allowing it to show, but that he is a savant on the guitar, right? Like, 100%. right. He is amazing. But now you get to see is he now has, all these years of experience, right? Like the fact that we got him past 27 is now we get to see his evolution of the 27 to 30 and all these other tools he's adding. Right. And then the, the 30 to 35, now he's a 40 year old guy that has, uh, you know, a, a lifetime of experience and knows all these tricks. Like he can play classical music. He can play, you know, when you give John, if anybody hasn't seen it, when Chappelle and, 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 and Dave, uh, Chappelle and uh, John Mayer get on stage in a comedy club and they can do this where John Mayer can play guitar to comedy bits. He can make noise. Like he can almost talk with a guitar, right? Like he has this command over the electric guitar and just guitar in general that I don't know if we've seen. Like, I feel like almost, I had this idea that what you see of those people, that, that talent that comes by like a Hendrix and that burns out, right? 
he yeah. was doing all that with just what was inside of him. He didn't have an internet. He didn't have all these things. He didn't have, you know, ultimate guitar.com where you see like, a guy really like, but like, then again, uh, you look at John, like in early nineties, you know, it's early nineties, you're reading guitar magazines and shit. And, but, but part of the thing of so much of John's vocabulary, I think on guitar, it's rooted in Clapton. It's rooted in Hendrix. And it's Steve Ray Vaughan. Steve Ray Vaughan. Steve yeah, Ray Vaughan. Exactly. Right. But that's, but that's what I'm saying. Now you have, you have Hendrix that comes in and he's building upon those that came before him, but he's also blazing this completely new trail where at the time John Mayer comes around, he has all this within him. And now I feel like it's almost like this argument. I don't know if you know anything about fighting MMA, but a little bit. Not, there's not, a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it, you won't, you won't need to know it for the, the point I'm going to make yeah. is they asked uh, there, there's a guy named George St. Pierre, one of the most famous Canadian fighters, right? He was just uh, an absolute icon still is a Canadian icon. And they had him, they're interviewing them the other day. And they said, there's this guy now who's in the same weight class that he used to fight in and that's just supremely dominant. And they were trying to ask him the, the, the questions of like, Oh, like when you talk about greatest of all time, how do you compare yourself? And he just said like, no, obviously the current guy is leaps and bounds ahead of me. That's just the evolution of this game, right? Like I was building upon those below me and it'd be an insult to the sport to say that those doing it currently aren't the best. And that if we matched up, if you could take them in a time machine, bring them back to the time when I was in my pride, he would have absolutely, you know, ragdolled me. It wouldn't have even been fair. And I feel like that's the same. It's different because guitar has been around a lot longer than that sport that they're talking about. But I feel like there's always that there's always going to be whoever's on the cutting edge today, especially with evolution and just guitar technology and, and loop pedals and, and all the distortion and all the, the, the things you have at play. And not to say that if you could take a Jimi Hendrix, put him in a time machine at 26, bring him to now, and then let him loose with all the, the stuff that you have and, and see what he could do. It's not to say that's not, but that's not reality. What we have is these savants like John Mayer that are alive today, doing it today, getting better every day and are at this cutting edge and is only getting better, right? Like that's the argument I want to say is now everyone says like, uh, one of the big ones always to me was at a very young age, my, my cousins and my uncle who, who were the first ones that showed me John Mayer, that actually the guys who showed me neon on, on that screen and had my jaw on the floor and made me fall in love with them was yeah, yeah. they said they got to see Clapton and John Mayer in a, within a couple months, I think it was. And they said like to be able to see the guitar playing and they both did it very similar, you know, like just kind of a, a very stripped down show and to see that they would have never admitted unless they had had that experience that, Oh, you can't talk about John Mayer and Clapton and say, you know, like Clapton's Clapton. Yeah, I said, Clapton. no, like when you have them laid out in front of, you know, like it is, and he's only gotten better. That was at least 10 years ago now. Oh, yeah. Right. I and mean, he, yeah. Go I mean, ahead. Clapton is there's interviews. He's like, I don't think John Mayer knows how good he is. And this is Clapton. He's like, he's like, yeah. he truly is a master guitar. He's like, I've been with him. I, we've done, you know, charity benefits. We've hung out, we've done gigs, all these things. And anytime it's just like, it's insane to watch him because he's in his own world. But like, if you try to tell him these things, he's just like, ah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just John being John. He's like, I'm John Mayer. You're Eric Clapton. He's like, but you're John Mayer, John. Like, yeah. Believe in yourself. And there's something I was thinking about when we were talking about Hendrix. It's like, <sighs> so I will say this. So like you have your Hendrix, you got BB King, you got, you know, buddy guy, you got Steve Ray Vaughn all these blues legends and i they definitely shaped john i mean mm -hmm. john first and foremost is a guitar player songwriter second i think and yeah. blues so rooted into what he loves and what he can mm -hmm. do but i was thinking about this you're like okay those are the older guys who inspired john mayer mm -hmm. is there anybody out there you think right now who like john mayer's really inspiring like who's the next like i guy? guarantee it i guarantee it I, and I, i'm I think, sure i think there's people who's inspiring but like in music right now, who do you think is like the next guy to take over? I, I have, and part of me worries about that. It's like John's alive still. And he's still in my mind, like he's the guy. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I see arguments on like Facebook and stuff. It's like, you know, why the guitar hero's dying out, you know, the last uh, the dying breed. And then everyone's always like, but we got John Mayer. It's like, yeah, yeah. But, but I feel like that's only the John Mayer. I feel like other people don't even realize that John Mayer's that good at guitar, right? Like if you ask somebody on the street, they, they, they have it still in their mind that that mindset that, you know, your body is a wonderland guy and they yeah. don't realize, no, he is like, he's the guy, he's the, the shredder of all shredders, right? Like listen to, uh, you know, covered in rain or, or oh my God, like, ah, uh, like there's so many songs you can point to or li and, and live appearances more so because like, I think you, you talk about, you only get so much on a studio album of, you know, what was on that day. But right. then there's times where, just in that moment when he's in his own world, I think he's actually talked about this on an interview one time. He, he said something, and it was one of the funniest things I've ever heard. He was talking about, he said like, sometimes I'm out there playing and it's like, I'm as, uh, I'm playing as good as, as good as I, I, I know I can. And it's just this, this peak level of, of play. Yeah. And then sometimes I play better. 
right? Like that's his, that's his standard is just like this yeah. high level. And then he said, and sometimes I don't even know what's happening. I don't need, it's surprising me just as much as surprising you. I just go to this next level and I don't know where it comes from. And that's almost kind of what Clapton was talking about, right? Like sometimes it, he doesn't realize exactly even what he's doing. He just is having fun in that moment. And that's what, and that's what you need because if you're trying, if you're aiming to do that, you never would reach it, right? It's, it's one of those things where you need to be in the flow state of just trying to enjoy it as much as you can and doing it for you and just, you know, battling against yourself. Yeah, sure. There's 30,000 people out in that crowd, but in that moment, it's just you and that guitar and you're just trying to see what yeah. can do and what comes out of you. Yeah. Oh. And oh my God, that's such a good point. I, I, I don't know. I'm really interested to see kind of what's going to go on with music. Cause you know, and not to be that old guy, cause I'm only 25, but like, I gotta say there, there's not a lot these days where I'm like super like, Oh fuck. Yeah. Like music's really <laughs> like good. Like, I'm not into the whole mumble rap scene. I don't yeah. care. I mean, it's still art and I can appreciate it, but it's not something that I'm like, Oh, I love this. Like if, and that's the one thing like, I'm not the guy to bring to a college party right now. Cause it's always just like loud rap music or like, you know, stuff like that. And like nothing against post Malone. I like post Malone, but I'm never really going to be like, it's a post Malone kind of day. And you know, and I don't know anybody else who's really in that world of John and selfishly. It's like, I want, I, I want another John Mayer. I mean, I, there will never be another John Mayer, but I want somebody mm -hmm. in that flavor of like, of like just that music. So Tom Mish, I'm like, we got Tom Mish. Great. Yeah. A lot of people. And I know who I've talked to. They're like, what about Sean Mendez? He's the nice guy. I'm like, I don't know if I see it. To me, Sean Mendez sounds like everybody else on hits one. Right. Like, and, yeah. and that's the same thing. Like my, and my, and my girlfriend, she's very much into R and B and she, always trying to show me these songs and like oh check out her like her voice is so amazing I'm like, yeah that's an amazing voice but it sounds like every other voice in that genre yeah. right like and it's like yeah. this is the same nothing sticks out to me and it's not like i dislike the genre but it all just sounds the same and every once in a while right like i definitely like certain genres more than others but yeah. i like all but i like all genres right like mumble rap like yeah not my favorite but there's a couple you know that broccoli song by i don't know who's saying that i fucking love that tune right like i'll jam yeah. that like the I yeah. always say like, and, and I always say like, I love every type of music, but scream like super hard scream. But even yeah. that, I like some songs in that, like there's almost no Brown and music I don't like, but there's just ones where I'm more picky about it. And only certain songs, whereas, you know, country for a while, I liked almost all country, right? Like, and you know, if, if you can make John Mayer a, a genre, I like everything he's put out. Same with Ed Sheeran. I like everything's put out. Actually, you know, another, another guy that uh, I think people kind of label with the one hit wonder brush a little bit is uh hosier or hosier whatever oh. like when when he came out with take me to church and everyone loved that song i was like oh that's great but then actually uh, another ex-girlfriend at the time said like no you should check out the rest of that album and i listened to it I was like, oh my god yeah. this is spectacular and then the album he just put out maybe two three years ago that's one of my favorite albums of the last like 10 years that that, so that with I was, movement on it oh i i was i was driving around the other day and i put my phone on shuffle when i drive i'm like let it be a surprise i have like ten thousand. Yeah. You know, a lot of them are always going to be John Mayer because I've yeah. sold much, yeah. but I have all the live stuff. I have bootleg stuff. It yeah, that was me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it. but um, what was it? Uh, it's like, I fall in love just a little bit every day. I don't know the song. Oh. That came on and I was like, I fucking forgot about this song. Such a good I, tune, hey? I was like, how did I forget about this song? It's so good. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, yeah. God, Hosier. One paint. Well, yeah. And yeah. He's so much more than that. Someone song. knew. That's what that song is called. Yeah, I just had to sing it a little bit in my head. If somebody saw me dancing there, that was me doing. It. I was just singing it until I got to the to the chorus. Yeah, someone knew is so good. And then you have uh, one of the funnest songs to play on guitar too. I really enjoy playing. I forget how to play it, but I remember when I did learn it, it was really yeah. fun. Yeah, I mean that that first record really good, and everyone's just like, "Take me to church." And so, yeah, God, I'm trying to think. What are some other one hit wonders we know? Oh, oh, and uh, actually, so so yeah, like Jose is one of those guys, and actually, somebody I just found again through uh, through uh, not SoundCloud, let's say Spotify. Uh, they put out the song. There's a band called Champagne Lane. I think they're pretty small, right? Like I, they're 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 not very big at all. Yeah, but they have this funky sound, man. Like I I don't know even how to describe it, but it is funky, and I love it. They have a couple tunes like Golden Hour, I think, is one, and uh, uh, Waiting for a Little Rain. Oh, these songs, man! Like it's just it's hard to point it to something to like tell people about it, but it's just like, if it's for you, it'll be for you. You might not like it, but if it is like, I think you'll like it. I just don't know if people yeah. listening, if you'd have to be the right kind of fan for it, but yeah. it is just, Oh, they've tapped into it. They've tapped into a little something there that is, uh, and actually I've reached out to them trying to get them on the podcast. I've got yeah. a little bit of maybe from So maybe, maybe they'll be on here in the future. That'd, but be, they, that'd be awesome, man. I mean, that's somebody, probably the only new guy that's small that I've seen that I see something like, Oh, that they got something there. Yeah. All right. So if you're looking for my picks, um, Marcus King band, you Marcus ever heard King them? Band. I don't know. That sounds kind of familiar, yeah. but this dude is so bluesy. Ooh. And it is 
uh, his, I think Texas. I think he's from Texas, but like yeah. he's bluesy and like one of the most unique voices I've ever heard in my life. Mm-hmm. Like, raspy, but so clear at the same time. Like if you just look up this old cowboy, yeah, let that song take you on a trip for like five and a half minutes. It is so good. Like, and that's the thing about music. You find all these things and mm-hmm. you know, I never would have even heard of Marcus King. And then someone just like, Oh, you like blues guitar. You, you might like this guy. I'm like, yeah, I'll check it out. And then you're like, oh, this is, this is phenomenal. So it's again, guitar, man. Guitar is the shit. It's oh, the actually the, the best album. Okay. So I, I gotta, I gotta throw one pick in before of a, of a young kid that's coming up. That's there's a guy named Coulter wall. He's from Lloyd or not Lloyd Minster, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Right. So yeah. one province over and he has a voice that is just next level. Right. And he was kind of getting big. And then Joe Rogan of all people heard yeah. of him, right. And started talking about him on the podcast. And, you know, so that's already a huge boon, right. And you could see his, him get quite popular. And then he asked him to come on the podcast and he said, no, I'm busy ranch and call me after. Right. So he goes down and ranches in Texas every year yeah. and, and big time Joe Rogan. So now he's just blown up and, you know, hasn't done much interview since then, but like his music. And when you go back to his catalog, just his talent is next level like if you want to look at like if you like old school country yeah. this kid is the truth like there's no if ands about it like Love you know when you hear a song like it doesn't matter what song you pick you just listen to him sing mm-hmm. and you know he's got he's got that yeah. so that's that's my pick for a young guy that's coming up that is 100 okay. destined to absolutely destroy the world and do whatever he wants but my pick for my favorite album i'd say i don't know for a long time maybe since john mayer put on an album just so i cover my uh, cover my own yeah. ass was uh, own ass, what's, yeah. his, what's this album even called you know uh uh donald glover so childish gambino yeah, yeah yeah he just put out an album maybe two years ago maybe a year ago and it's got like some of the songs aren't even titled they're just like the the number of like where it falls yeah. in, in in the running time yeah. that album was so amazing like is this the blue one i'm trying to think of its name is it like i think blue? it's white i think it's white I think, it, I think it's all, I'm, thinking, yeah. I'm thinking i'm thinking the one that has red bone on it so no no no, no. It, was the, it was the one it was the one after that so it's his okay. newest one oh, okay childish i'll just pull it up so i can tell people because it is one of the most amazing amazing so it's called 3 15 20 like okay. just the like 3 dot 15 dot 20 so it's just the date he released it and then yeah like i said there's a bunch of the songs are just the numbers of like where they fall in the running time but that album start to finish like it's one of those ones that it's one of those ones where you sit down you know have your drink, have your snacks and just let play, let it lay over you, let it take you for the whole experience. Right. Cause it's one of those songs flow into the others. There's uh, you know, emotional, but I felt like not only is the music amazing, it really grabs you into, but it tells you a story, man. Like I, 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 I cried multiple times throughout this oh. album, like, and have since just listened to it. Like it brings me back to that first time listening to it. And I, I felt like when I listened to it, it was right at the start of lots of the, the black lives matter protests and a lot of the, and just yeah. all that upheaval. And I felt like I learned more about the black experience and like what yeah. goes through from that album and not, and that wasn't even the goal of like that was released before. And, and is completely like the album touches so many areas. That's not what it's about at all, but it's just so true. And there's so much in it. And just some of the lyrics that he drops that are just in the middle and it just hit you so deep. Like, man, I tell you it, like, and you know, usually like there's an album where one song will make you cry. It's like, no, I've cried at like almost every song in this album at one point would just hit me the right way that has made me fucking ball like a baby i love that album and it was so okay. funny because my because when it first came out my girlfriend's like you have to listen to this album I'm like, yeah yeah whatever because she's pretty hit or miss on her uh her <laughs> song uh her yeah. song selection sometimes it's, it's yeah, but- sometimes she gives me amazing ones i feel like it's just, and it's not her fault it's just me being a hard guy to read i have real weird taste it's hard to give me something okay. that i like like, and then finally, probably it was like six months after she first told me, I finally listened to this album. It's got me crying. It's got me, it's got me all in my feels. It's got so much. Right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and then ever since then, I just bugged her. I'm like, oh, have you ever heard this album? Right. Cause she, that she had that moment. It's like, are you kidding me? I told you about this like six <laughs> months ago. Like now you just listen to it now and it's, you're telling everybody about it. But yeah, no, I think that's probably the best album I've heard in, uh, in a long time was that one. But yeah, yeah. no, and I'm sure there's more young up and comers that I'm not thinking I, of that are, uh, that are bubbling under the surface. I have that album that like makes me lose my shit every time. So it'd be, it'd be kind of like a two. I don't know if it's cheating, but first off, I would go, Swimming by Mac Miller, and I'm not like a huge rap guy, but that album came out, and the first few songs came out. I was like, oh my god, like yes, and well, and again, Small Worlds. Oh, that's, that's a good tune. You know, you, that's John playing guitar. You know that, right? What? Yeah, that's John playing guitar. John went over to Mac's house. They were hanging out, and Small Worlds was like still kind of being worked on, and John's like, "Give me a guitar." So no the, way. But do 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 do. 
Oh, now I gotta go listen to the song right after this. Yeah. I can't believe that. That's one of my favorite songs by Mac Miller. Oh, I love that yeah. song. Yes. So and John, yeah, John was talking to his manager. He's like, I gotta start getting paid when I do like you know features and shit. So he yeah. went over to Max's house, grabbed a guitar, played that, and they've like finished Small Worlds like that day. And then Max's like, okay, like what's up? And John's like, nah, man, just it just have it. You know, I'm just yeah, I was yeah, glad yeah. to be there. And I've heard him talk about it in interviews, and he and Mac became like really close. So yeah, like, oh, and, like mm-hmm. really good friends. So you know, I liked that song before I knew John was attached to it. And John didn't mm-hmm. say anything at first, and then he's like. I had the privilege to play on this song. I'm like, oh my God, that's why it's my favorite song on the record. Like, yeah, that's it's funny because I was like, I don't have, I think I have like maybe three Mac Miller songs on my phone, but that's one of them. And it was one of my buddies, you know, my best friend from his song. And I'm like, Matt, what is this song? Like, I yeah. love this song. And I, you know, it's funny that that has that tie to it. And it's, yeah. it's almost crazy how many songs have John Mayer playing on it because John Mayer did the guitar on so many songs. Like there's Ed Sheeran songs. There's, uh, yeah. oh, who's that young Canadian kid that was on? Uh, Alec Benjamin, no. No. He was on current moods with uh, with Chappelle and him one time. Oh, he's one of my Dan favorite. Up- no, what's his name? Oh, this is Dan- gonna kill me. Uh, Daniel Caesar. It is Daniel. Oh, dude, yeah, Dan- yeah. Daniel he- Caesar. Oh, he is good too. He he's- has a he has a talent to him. He's gonna yes, be he- something big too. He really is. Um, but yeah, no. So, swimming came out, and I remember I was on a date with this girl, and I was like just starting to like kind of do this. Girl. It didn't work out. It doesn't matter. But like, yeah, I'm on a date, my my phone goes off. It's like you know, USA Today uh malcolm miller has just passed away at 26 years old and i was like oh my god and i i i shit you not i was listening to that album on the way to the day just hanging out like what the fuck so it's weird how it happened and so that and i felt really upset for myself like i really just got into mac miller and thundercat you listen to thundercat at all no i don't think so thundercats he's funky he's really oh yeah Uh, he and john have hung out before like he's oh um, shit yeah thundercat was really good friends with uh, Mac Miller and he's right. played on the record and, you know, there's a connection there too. But so it's 2018 when that album comes out 2020, which is the year we all want to forget, understandably um, out of nowhere, but out of fucking nowhere in Instagram, um, Mac Miller's page posts something for the first time in like a y- years. They say tomorrow we are going to launch or drop swimming or no, we're going to drop circles, which is the follow-up to swimming Mac had recorded basically all of this, but we've spent the last year and a half really perfecting it and really mixing it. Um, If you like it, please listen to it. If not, that's okay. But this is like our final thing for you. Mm -hmm. When that album came out, I lost my shit. And I don't know why, but like just even the first track, it just starts off and it's just Mac being like, well, this is what it looks like. And if, if you listen to that album, I'm getting choked up talking about it. If you listen to that album, it's it is scary, like reflective. Yeah. Because so much of that album is just like everybody lives, everybody dies. I'm here until you know the end of the ride. And then like you listen, you're like, and here's a guy who just got off the ride too early. Mm-hmm. So if you want to talk about an album that would make me fucking just ball like a bitch, it's yeah. that it's that one. I mean, and there's some really fun songs on that one. Blue World. Blue is World. A- that's that's the other one. That's yeah. one of the that's one of the three songs I have on my phone. Yeah. Is, Blue World is, is, is that's an awesome song. I think yeah. he made that with uh disclosure. The mm. like uh, yes, yeah, so they did that like a year or two before he passed away, and then that got put on. And but it's just like a hyper aware record, and it's almost like him saying goodbye. Mm-hmm. And the way the record ends, like it starts off on this like musical note, and the way it ends. It's like once a day I rise, once a day I fall asleep with you and all this stuff. And then I'm trying to figure out what's going on in my mind. And the ending note is really weird. But if you let it play into good news, it just goes right back in because it's a circle. Yeah. The album is so well done. And it's so like aware on Max Park. Like, you know, it's like he knew he just wasn't going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. And he puts this out and you're like, I would have killed to see this live and yeah. no you never can and that's the worst like when you yeah. find it, you're like i'll never get a chance to see this live mm-hmm. i'll never get a chance to see you know them do this and what could have you know come so when we look at like hendrix we look at mac miller and i'm not saying there's like really comparable you look at artists who really affect you at such a young age and you're like thank god we got john thank god we got mm-hmm. edge thank we god we have people who have navigated this crazy world of, you know, fame, success, mm-hmm. expectations, and, you know, attitudes and you know, temptations and substance yeah. and all that shit. 
And, and 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 then also too is to navigate that music world, which is what the most things that excite me about people starting record labels out of their bedroom because I feel like so much of it too is not only do you need to survive all the fame and the drugs and all that stuff, but you also have this entire industry that's trying to take what you do and put their little grubby fingers on it, right? And and you know get their little you know piece of what it is and try and say like, oh, I did that, you know, just like yeah. they do with movie scripts and, and stuff. They do that with music too. Everybody and, wants a piece of the pie. Yeah. And, and, and it's so hard to let people. And I think a guy like John Mayer knew that and said, okay, you guys, I'm going to let you fit around on my little, my pop albums, these ones, and then I'm slowly yeah. going to phase you out. And then you're just going to get pure John Mayer once I've proven to you guys what I can do. But that's yeah. amazing that he got to that point and wasn't completely chewed up and spit out and didn't have that voice anymore because oh, it really is. it's not easy to retain that throughout that. And you yeah. hear people talk about that. You know, the reason there's that trope of selling your soul to the devil in the music industry is very yeah. real because that's exactly what it is. It's more metaphorical than, than what I think some people, right. uh, you know, I've watched a couple of YouTube videos would think it's that, but it's that it's about, if you want to make the money and, and be that person and get in with these record labels, you need to, to, you know, change your sound and, 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 uh, what's the word like, uh, compromise you, you at points. Compromise. There's, there's a thing with John. Um, it's the Berkeley. I'm trying to think where he does this, like, it's like an eight mini series, like episodes, but it's him doing like a clinic at Berkeley college of music. Yeah. Talking to the kids. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, He's like, the number one thing you have to do is like set up, like defy your expectations. Like if you say you're just going to be like an acoustic songwriter kind of hanging out, that's fine. But no, that's what you're going to be. And then don't mm. stick with me like, I want to be a rock star. You know, he's yeah. like, and he's like, you need to know when to compromise. He's like, you know, there are songs I've compromised on, but like when the record company says, Hey, you know, we think that you should take off, you know, the piano part and stop his train, probably condense that song. He's like, absolutely not. So like, that's, that's two personal songs. Like, I know that stop his train is not a song on the radio but I know it lives on that record and it has a lot of life to it. Mm-hmm. It's like compromise where you can, but there's another band. I don't know. You know, Hyam, the three sisters. I don't think I do. I uh, know. They got some really good stuff. They're oh, like, yeah. yeah uh, do I have their? Yeah. I actually just got this the other day. Their newest record, which is uh, women in music part three. Vinyl. Hey, yeah. Vinyl. Yeah. But um, I check it out, but I've heard them talk about it. They're like, you know, they get treated these three sisters out of California who are phenomenal musicians, phenomenal songwriters, and they're just really unique. And there's like a sense of authenticity and the fact that maybe they're family and sisters, they have this bond, like, and it's a band, but they make it work. And th- I've heard them say stuff, you know, we, we've had to compromise a lot in the industry because we're, you know, female and we've had a, mm-hmm. we had to prove ourselves. I'm like, yeah, that sucks. And that's bullshit. And this industry, you know, it definitely can be BS. Mm-hmm. Again, you got to figure out what you want, but, you know, I root for so many young musicians, like especially Nick. I root for Nick so Yeah, fun. me too. Me too. Every yeah. time I see him doing something cool, and I feel like every once in a while, I don't know if it's just Instagram, just won't show him to me every once in a while. And Nick yeah. Ames, if anybody wants to check him out on Instagram, uh, maybe we I'll even throw him out, throw him in the description because he was yeah. someone that both me and Mike, uh, you know, interacted with lots when he was a lot smaller and just, you know, and yeah. he's a huge John Mayer guy too, and Ed Sheeran yeah. guy. And he probably would be, you know, the third, the third fiddle on this conversation. Maybe we'll have oh, to do that at one point, get all three of us on here. Oh, have this be, conversation. Oh we'll have to do it for sure. But but he, like when you're talking about me and Mike's level of playing guitar and that's, you know, very different levels already, but then you take Nick and he is, uh, he's Nick, got some talent. He Nick, is special. He's phenomenal. And I, you know, maybe he'll hear this. I mean, and I don't know if he'll give a shit if I says, first off, please check out his EP. If, if there's anything yeah. I can plug in this, check out Nick Ames EP, yeah. Lack of Agency. You know, he would send me songs unreleased and he would just send them. He's like, Shh, don't, don't say anything. Yeah. I would listen to these rough demos in my car driving to school and where I'm like, these are fucking awesome. So when that, and I knew the songs that were coming out and when they came, I'm like, I'm so happy. This is out in the world. Like he's mm-hmm. remastering shit. Like it's crazy. And he's endorsed by Paul Reed Smith. I remember like being with him on that. Like I was emailing him and talking. He was like, what do I do? He was like, you know, I, I kind of want to be a BRS instrument, like, you know, representative. I'm like, tell them you love them. Also your first single ever was on a PRS. Like, and you built your kind of like real songs on that guitar. And so they're like, all right, here's a PRS. And they sent them one, which is so fucking awesome. Yeah. But Nick is such a talented musician. I mean, he's a huge John Mayer guy, huge Ed, Ed Sheeran guy, Prince. Like he's all over the place. He has a mm-hmm. blues trio and, he hasn't even really posted anything on his Instagram page for the blues trio. And they already have like a couple thousand followers. Cause he is that good. Yeah. And so, you know, when we talk about guitar players, like rising up, like I want Nick to do so well. And I can yeah. say, yeah, he can do it. I know. For he sure. Can. Yeah. It's like, just 
And do I think him being in Boston, Massachusetts might be not the best location? Yeah, maybe, but I don't know Boston that yeah. well. You know, I'm in Michigan. Yeah, I'm in Michigan. I'm in Ohio. I'm kind of back and forth, but that's what I love about Instagram. I mean, you know, and, and the these- internet in general just allows you to to bring in, in SoundCloud, right? Like, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, and there's some people that who follow Nick, and I'm just like fucking Peter Horn, like you know Danish Pete from my uh, Anderton's music follows Nick. And like, I guess they're like, they talk around that Nick, Nick's met people at, you know, uh, some guitar. Oh, what's the word? Not Nam. Yeah. Like Nam guitar fest in the California. He's met yeah. some people. It's like, dude, like I want this guy to succeed so hard because mm-hmm. I he, he can do it. And I know yeah. he will do it. And it's just a matter of, you know, people recognizing the guy's talent and listening to his stuff. And, and, and him never giving up pretty much like at, at a certain yeah. point, that's pretty much what it is. Is if you don't give up, you will get there. You just got to, put everything you got into it every day and not get, you know, <sighs> chewed up by that industry. Cause that's almost what it's designed to do is just chew up 99% and just spit out the 1% that can, that can make it right. Like, ah, oh, yeah. And then that's, and that's kind of the crazy thing about it. I mean, it's you, again, how much do you believe in yourself? Mm. You have to really believe who you are and like what you can do. Sorry, I have this bag. It's like, no, it's all good. It's all good. And and I think another piece of that too, is when somebody's doing something like that, of chasing that type of dream that brings up in everybody else that he encounters, it's going to bring up the fact they're not, whatever that is for them. Right. Like that's Nick's dream. But yeah, whenever he encounters somebody that is, you know, uncertain in themselves, that brings up all that feelings of the things they didn't chase. Right. So then all you want to do is tell them it's not going to work. You know, they, you just want to tell them because you're essentially making yourself feel better about what you didn't do. You want to tell that to them because that's going to make you feel worse. If he, if he proves the concept, Oh, it can be done right now. That shows you whatever your dream was, you know, maybe it's knitting or whatever it was. You didn't chase that. So now you're dealing with it. Just like John Marin, just like all these other guys, right. Anybody that chases a dream like that is going to run into that same thing. And it's about having that that faith in yourself and in your talent and in your, your passion and your drive to not let those people, not, not to let those people in and to just block it out and keep those blinders on and keep moving forward. And that's a tough thing to do. It's a, it's not an enviable position, but it's admirable. It, yeah, it, honestly it is. And it's, mm-hmm. if I thought that I had the time and if I had really sat with it, if I spent like a couple of years getting really good guitar, you know, maybe I'd put some songs. I've written songs. I've sent shit to Nick. I'm like, yeah, you know, and there's been talks like he and I might like hang out one day. I'm like, this might make it on sometime. I'm like, I don't have to be doing anything. Just let me play like a riff on this song. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I fucking did it. You know, like I'm with Nick Ames, but it's, it's weird. Like, and I think the problem is like dreams are so fucking scary because mm-hmm. they're dreams and you, you set out hoping you can achieve these dreams, but you have to believe in yourself and, you know, I don't, for people listening, if it sounds cliche and stupid, okay, yeah, sure. But like, you really have to be so disciplined mm-hmm. in what you're doing. And you look at these musicians like Mayer and Sheeran and Clapton and everybody, because at some point they were some kid who didn't know what the fuck they were doing mm-hmm. playing. Guitar. And then they'd be looking at them out. Yeah. And it's, and it's weird how once you make it, everyone's on your side. Mm-hmm. Which I think is, I think it's total bullshit. It's like, <laughs> no, be on their side from day one. And even if they don't make it, that's okay. At least you're there. And you're like, well, you, you tried What's better than most people do. Yeah. And, and actually uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, his name's Andrew Schultz. He's out of, he's out of uh, New York. Yeah. And he, I love and, yeah. yeah. So, so Schultz, he was always, you know, barred from the industry. They wouldn't let him in and all this stuff. And he really had to, he did his own thing, went on YouTube, released his own stuff, right. Kind of yeah. did the the independent route yeah. and, and, and achieved this, you know, ridiculous success that nobody, well, I think lots of people saw coming like myself that was following and that was, you know, his, his fans, he had a very dedicated fan base, but then one of the biggest lessons I learned from him was then when he did reach those heights, it's so easy to be that person that just says, well, you know, so Netflix wouldn't give him, especially put it out and did that. And then when Netflix came calling again, you know, he could have said, go fuck yourself. But no, he said, no, no, I understand what that was. The business is business. Now I'm the business and you want a piece of me. It's going to cost you extra, but we can do business. And to keep that, I feel like it's so easy because it's, it's easy to get, uh, not victimized, like, uh, where you become jaded almost. Yeah. It's, it's really easy to just, yeah. Kind of lose your way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, again, we talk about this, like, you know, like mayor, especially like you try so hard and for so long and no one believes you and you finally do it and say, well, fuck you it's really easy. And I think it's a natural response to be like, yeah, well, fuck you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I did it and you didn't believe in me and I'm going to do it. Yeah. And, 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 and I think what's almost admirable with something like that is 
it's so hard to hold on to the, to get through this industry and get through all these ups and downs, holding oh, yeah. that, that belief in yourself intact. But I think one of the easiest ways to get through that is to become jaded and to wall yourself off. And now it's just you, you're holding on, you're holding on to that belief in yourself, but to the exclusion of everything else. So now it's yeah. fuck everybody, but me, I'm going to do this. I believe in yourself. And that will get you through that will stop. That will be the fire that drives you. But then you get to the end and now you're jaded and nobody wants to work with you. And you're, and, and you're, you're on that side. Whereas, you know, it's even more admirable for somebody like Schultz or someone like John Mayer, who not only held on to themselves throughout that whole process and didn't get torn apart or turned yeah. into some, somebody that they weren't, but they did it without becoming jaded and becoming that person they, at the end of the day, you don't want to be anyways, right? Like you, you held on to that belief, but now that's everything you are is just your belief in yourself and your own ego. I think yeah. that's just as easy of a trap to fall into than not making there all together. So to not only accomplish holding on to that throughout your whole career, but then also be able to do that and be that person and be that source of positivity and stuff still is so admirable and so rare. I don't think they get, it gets enough credit, just that piece, right? There's all the credit for the Grammys and all that stuff. But what's more impressive to me is that, that you can still be, that he can still go on current mood and put out exactly who he is and still to yeah. be in touch with that inner child of his that is the source of all this amazing music and all this amazing yeah. things that he's brought to the world to still have be able to tap into that at this point, not have that been chopped off because that's all that industry is starting to do is, I need to chop this pipeline off and you just make you into a machine of just, you're going to put out the pop hit every two year, every year until yeah. you're burnt out and, and we kick you off the street and bring in the new kid. Right. And to be yeah. able to hold on to that. And I, I really feel like mayor especially was lucky enough that he was kind of like one of the last guys in of that generation where it was mm. like, once you're in, you're in. Yeah. You know, I, like there are still like record, like still Columbia records still has to go to drama and like, yo, Let's put it on an album here. You know, like let's 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 get you going again. Let's bring you back to the world. Like, you know, you're still John Mayer, you're still very successful. But like they also are kind of like, you want to take some time and make a record, take a few years, that's cool. Because mm-hmm. he's already done the work. You know, he's he's put the effort in. He's put, you know, seven Grammys, he's put like seven records out. Like, yeah, he can kind of do what he wants to do. He can go take weird trips and go hang out with the dead and company, or he can go help people write their own stuff. Like, that's cool. But and it is so tough, I think, that. And he's even said, he's like, you know, looking back on it now that I'm older and I have that perspective, like, yeah, like I am, he's like, you know, musicians help each other through this. And like, I, and I'm glad to be the older guy. I was like, just, it's going to be okay. Like yeah. stay true to you. And like, you're going to figure this out and like surround yourself with good people. And, you know, he never did drugs and shit. I mean, he drank for a little while, then he quit drinking. And he's like, you know, my life is great. You know, I didn't fall into any of that shit, which is, that's, that's a huge part of it too. You mm-hmm. fall Asians of you know substance abuse and other issues but mm-hmm. at the end of the day if you're if you that's what you want to do and you know you're going to do it you'll get it done you'll find a way and my advice to people not that you know i'm putting out music or anything but i look at nick and i'm like this is a guy he is the definition of bedroom player yeah and i mean in like the best way because that's that's all how I, like so many of nick's old videos were like him in his bedroom just mm-hmm. putting I was like, here's like a 15 minute second clip of me playing neon. Well, once Instagram gave you a minute, that's when Nick was like, yes. And he figured it out. He's like, I'm going to put out little mini covers or yeah. I do like Fender has sent him shit. PRS sends him shit. Like, I don't know even who he's endorsing these days, but like, yeah, he's out there doing it. Yeah. And he's not doing it just to be like, I'm doing it. He's like, I'm doing this because I love this. And this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so cool to see that there's a few other people on Instagram who I think started off that way. And I don't know what they do necessarily. I like, you know, Gabriel Bergman. Hmm. I don't know yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He's got super Eagle. He's got like a really nice guitar collection. You know, I don't know what he does. He lives in California. He's met John a few times, you know, he's, he's kind of that Lucky guy. bastard. He, he is, he is. And yeah. he's kind of like, yeah, I met John. And you know, so much of what Gabriel has done is like very much what John has done. Mm-hmm. Like, he's followed, like he's followed the thing to a T which I think is like too bad. Like it's too much. Like I, I adore John there. I love the music. I love the guy. And you know, yeah, if I had the means to be wearing Patek Philippe watches and just insane Nikes and having the time of my life, of course we'd all do it, but you know, we don't. Although I do have the uh, John Mayer Casio G. There you go. There you go. I tried to get one. I, it was sold out before I could get one. I'm, I'm, I'm very jealous of it. I got it on stock X. Oh, yeah, I got gotcha, you. I got you. Yeah. So it actually wasn't too bad, but I, I I woke up that day and I was like, do I want it? I don't know. And the minute I was like, yeah, I want it. It was like, we're gone. It was like I <laughs> yeah. nine, nine minutes. They sold them. Like, Fuck. And I went to G shock and they're like, oh, we crashed. And John was like, we, I, I don't know how many they put out, but, and I also think that's so cool. Like from the watch Lord, that is John Mayer. And I don't know if you know anything about like watches or like just through John Mayer is kind yeah. of how I 
understand yeah. anything about that's, watches. That's how I got into it, like a lot. And I have like a decent collection. Like it's nothing crazy. Like I don't have any insane. The most like insane thing I probably have is this, the Casio G Shock, because it was a Houdinki collaboration with John Mayer. I'm like, the guy who has literally like hundred thousand dollar watches, his first watch collab is like a hundred and twenty dollar, you know, Casio. How yeah. fucking cool is that? That's awesome. It's so John Mayer. It's awesome. It, it, and then it's like, it did not need to be that. It could have been like $500 and people still would have went ape shit for it. Or it could have been, you know, seven, whatever. But like, he's not in it for that. He's in it because it's fun. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you like it? Cool. Like my name's attached to it. I designed it with Casio and it's like, it's, it is what it is. I was like, that's so fucking cool. He's a people, he's a people person. Mm-hmm. And Ah, so many people just get the guy wrong. It bums mm-hmm. me out. I know. And, and, and one of the things that I see, I'm, I fell in love with podcasts probably about five or six years ago and have been obsessed with them since that's kind of when my guitar took a hit because I just, I love yeah. podcasts so much and what they are. And I always wish John Mayer would either start a podcast or start being a guest on podcasts. And he's done a couple, done a right? Few. Like he's done a few. And, and but Dean they, Del Rey. Dean Del Rey. Dean Del Rey. Oh, I'm so glad you saw that. That's exactly yeah. where I was going to go because I was going to say like, I, I heard him. I had heard him do some podcasts before, but it felt like he was still treating it like an interview and he didn't really let the walls down and let who John Mayer was out yeah. and tell that one with Dean Del Rey, right? And the comedian felt comfortable, knew him from the comedy store. And the, the conversations they had about watches and about buying two of every, like if you really love something, buy one multiple rock, of one stock, yeah. I, that, that conversation changed my life because I always felt that way, but I never felt like I had the permission to do it because like if I love something, yeah, like like these, uh, these Ugg slippers that I'm wearing around the house, like, I yeah. have like four pairs in the garage just so that like when yeah. I, when, an, and eventually they fall apart because I wear them every time I walk in the house, all around the house all the time, I yeah. have another pair. And that fills me with such satisfaction to know that I have the extra pair they're oh. waiting. And if I wreck these, it doesn't matter because, yeah. you know, like, like this continuum hoodie, like yeah. I'm almost scared to wear it because I don't want to wreck it because I don't have extras of it. Right. And to know yeah. that, and just to almost have that permission given to me by, you know, John Mayer of all people like, Oh no. Hey, if you want, if you really love something, yeah, you can buy two or three of them. Like that's fine. As long as you can afford it. Right. Like that was such a game changer to me. If anybody's listening and is a John Mayer fan, you've got to go listen to the podcast with Dean Del Rey. I think he did it in two parts and they were beautifully done. It is so, there's just so much energy and it's all Mm -hmm. conversation. Like it's a music lovers podcast. It's like, watch like, there's just so much you can, anyone can get out of it. And for me, like, is it, so I, I'm a big collector of like bourbon. Yeah. So we kind of talk about this. So I have pretty decent collection, but like, and I'm very much one of those people, like some of my bottles are like, they're, they're really hard to get. And I've been lucky. I mean, I work at a liquor store, so, you know, I, I kind of know what's coming in you know, yeah. you know, I don't get special treatment, but you know, I, know I get a little yeah, special I might know a guy. But I know, I know a guy, the guy's me. And uh, sometimes, you know, I get lucky and I get like some, like, for example, for anyone listening, I don't know if you know Bourbon, like E.H. Taylor, single barrel. It's, it's a pretty sought after one. And I'm lucky enough to have two. One of them is open and one stays open and one stays closed until I get another one. And it's like, and having that one to rock and one to stock is the greatest feeling. One to rock and one to stock. I like that. One to rock, one to stock. And I have some shoes like, yeah, like, so ultra boosts, yeah, you know, shoes are one of those things like you spend money on, but like you're going to get your miles out of them. So like ultra boost is like, yeah, I will always have like one, like on reserve and like one, I just be into the ground. Yeah. And that's another thing. It's like, if you really love something, I would say, don't be afraid, like wear it out. Like this watch. I mean, I wear almost every day. Yeah. And when I first got it, I was like, oh my God, like this is the Casio John Mayer G-Shock. Like I, I can't take this out of the case. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's the whole point. He that's the whole point of the watch. That's the whole point of anything. So I have yeah. watches that, you know, I've, I've gotten over the last year or so. I'm like, okay, this is, it's a nice watch. Like, Oh, I gotta be careful. And then now I'm just kind of, I'm not like, Hey, totally like just fuck it. I don't care what happens, but you know, I'm also somebody who loves scratches and patina. Cause there's a story <laughs> It's like my first yeah. guitar. I'll grab it real quick. You might be able to see the neck. I mean, the people listening won't be able to see it, but this first guitar I got the Squire Strat. Like, if you can kind of see the neck of it, like it's different colors. That's yeah. like that's just playing. That's like mm-hmm. sweat. That's, that's like, love. That's love. That's yeah. love. This is and this is like my day one. Like up here, it's like almost green because like I played so much up here and sweated and like I've worked in the wood. Like it's smooth neck. Like yeah, it's, it's my first guitar. Is it the greatest guitar? No. Is it my favorite? It always will be because it's the yeah. first one. You know, and I've had some work done on it. I've changed out pickups and stuff to try to get the mayor tone, but then you realize, no, you're never like, going to get the mayor tone. <laughs> it's like, I know people who are like, I got a Dumble, I had a two rock, I got a 
you know, one of the 83 limited uh, black one Fender replicas. And it's like, that's cool. You put that in my hands and I can play you Mayer songs. It'll never sound like Mayer. Yeah. I and, wonder how much, if you, if you could add up all the money that was ever spent in the world of people trying to make their guitar sound like John Mayer and it's just wasted. There's probably like billions of dollars out there well, over the years. Of people there's trying. a guy in uh, China who has this insane collection. Like, he has every single John Mayer guitar. Like I, I found an Instagram. I'll have to send it to you, but it's, yeah. he has like the two rock John Mayer custom amps. He has, you know, super Eagle. He has like, pro, like a prototype of stuff. Like I think John's even met the guy like in Japan, yeah. or, like signed one of his guitars. Like, Hey, that's cool. Like, you put some time and effort in like, I appreciate that. But as for as much as I love John Mayer and anyone who's playing guitar, don't be the next John Mayer, be the next you, which sounds so stupid. Yeah. But yeah. It's, you, it's very true. Cause you know, if you, if you, if you try and be the next John Mayer, you're not going to fulfill your, your full, uh, uh, what you could be your full potential, right? Like that's yeah. by the only by, you can be influenced, but only by chasing what you want to do and what really excites you and what you're passionate about and chasing that to its ends is the only way you're ever going to, you know, really touch the, the, the full vastness of what you could be. And I feel like that's in everything that's in guitar, that's in business, that's in, in, in relationships, that's in, that's in everything. It's okay to be influenced, but you got to be true to who you are. I know. And it sounds so hippy dippy to say, yeah. but it's very true. And it's very important in so many of these realms. And I think more people understood that. I think it's just tough. Music is so hard. It's so scary to try and follow your own path. It's so hard to cut your own trail that it's so much easier just to say I'm going to pick this person. I'm going to model off of that and just kind of yeah. copy it completely. That's the, that's the easy thing, but whatever is worth it is never easy. And that's why I mentioned uh, Gabriel, who's a good guy. I and mean, Gabriel Bergman, I mean, you know, but like very much like he has followed like the mayor route to a T like he's got yeah. Fender stuff and like he's got super and there's nothing wrong with that. If that maybe that's, that. like, if you can do it, you know, go for it. But mm -hmm. I'd say be inspired, but also be original. Yeah. You know? Which is what I see in Nick, right? You see, you can definitely tell who his influences are. And oh. John Mayer's one of the biggest ones in Ed Sheeran, but he definitely has his own sound too, right? Oh. That he kicks into it and, and is not afraid to let himself come through on that stuff. And that's, uh, that's, what's interesting. That's, what's going to keep it interesting because I think it's interesting to hear somebody, you know, be a John Mayer clone as well, but it loses its taste because at, at a certain point, if you want John Mayer, you're going to go what, listen to John Mayer, right? Like at a certain <laughs> point. Yeah, but it's like, you know, and you'll see people like, I can do the next John Mayer. Like first off, but no. But, oh uh, yeah, that's a. World, it's like in a world where John Mayer exists, why would I sell for anything less than you know John? Yeah, and that's again we go back to Nick. It's like Nick's doing his own thing. There's one Nick Hames, mm -hmm. and Nick Hames is influenced by Prince. Nick Hames is influenced by John Mayer, Led Zeppelin, uh, you know Ed Pink Sheeran, Bull, Ed Sheeran, Goo Goo Dolls. Like he's mm. he's so connected to all these things, and yeah, his playing is like that's Nick. That's 100 percent Nick. And yeah, you'll hear from moments like. That's kind of Stevie Ray a little bit right there. That's yeah, like, yeah, definitely. He's got a lot of yeah. Stevie Ray in there. And it's yeah, funny like because when you're listening to it, it's like, is that John Mayer or is that Stevie Ray Vaughan? Because that is such a tightrope oh, of, yeah. you know, interstitial. Like, it's so, it's so hard to parse out which one's which. And then when it's gone to the next layer of somebody being influenced by it, you can you just can't tell. Yeah, I mean, you really can't. And that's, yeah. again, that's why music's so cool because you just, you, you find these things and you're like, okay, well, this is kind of this vibe or it's kind of this vibe. And like, mm -hmm. well, you'll play songs and... I think playing along to music is really fun. I do it all the time. I'll put a song on and like, yeah, I'm, I'll just play different shit over it. You know, just yeah. train your brain and your ear to like get rid of the guitar, which is, it's weird to do. It's kind of hard to do at first, but like you get used to it. And you're like, no, I'm the only one playing this right now. Yeah. You have music in the background and it's, you know, I don't know how, uh, what's the word I'm looking for. It is narcissistic. I guess it is to put on a BB King song and say, I'm going <laughs> to over BB King. Yeah. yeah. But you just do fun shit like that. Like I'm gonna play along with Clapton, or I'll just be the guy sitting in. Just picture that shit. You know, that's that's fun. Well, uh, I could talk John Mayer all night. I think you know that by now. Oh, but unfortunately, the Oilers game is starting in ten minutes, and and oh, that's the that is the one thing that comes before the podcast. I got to get to my Oilers. But I, think I love that. Since uh, since we talked about BB King uh, at the end, I got I got to I'll, I'll end it with a joke. It's my dad's favorite BB King joke. All right. Um, so, so this couple, uh, is, uh, the wife, the wife comes home and, and she says to her husband, Hey, I got a BB King tattoo on, on my ass. And he goes, Oh, Oh yeah. And she goes, yeah. Oh, let's see it. So she says, yeah, I got BB and she, and she pulls down her pants and bends over and shows it to him. He goes, BB, who's Bob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's uh that's his favorite. That's his favorite BB King joke. So I had to, I had to squeak that one in there. I, I, I feel that. like there'll be, uh, some people that have definitely heard that one from him before because he likes to recycle, but uh, hey, he's got to save the planet somehow. But uh, no, that was such a fun conversation. I've been dying to have. Oh, dude. It's, there's there's so probably like, 
there's probably like 15 conversations I've been dying to have in all these different areas. Right. And John Mayer is one of them. It's just, well, I got to find the right person. So I reach out to say, I need somebody to come in and talk some mayor with me. And you were all about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad oh, I'm thankful. Fun. I'm uh, it was so yeah. much fun to catch up. We got to, we got to hop on Instagram live and do some jams here at some point, yeah. break the guitar back out. Oh yeah, dude, this, this has been a blast. The first, po- first podcast ever done. And I mean, nobody else that I've started with. So thank you for that. Um, I'd love to come back. We'll talk anything, man. Like, yeah, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. And and I think and I think definitely at some point we'll have to get me, you, and Nick on here and uh, and get all three of us talking about John Mayer and uh, oh, see if any tears come out or what else goes fast because I think me and you are almost at that point a couple of times. It'll be amazing. Awesome. Well, thanks again. I I, I uh, can't say thanks enough. That was tons of fun. Yeah, dude. Thank you so much for reaching out. I loved it. And anytime, we'll do this again. All right, we'll do it soon. Perfect. All right, John Mayer Extravaganza 1 in the books. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys enjoyed all the music. I hope you picked out uh, at least one or two songs or artists that you can go and listen to and hopefully fall in love with. Um, I hope this starts a whole next genre or path that this podcast can go down is just having people on and just gushing about our favorite artists, wherever that overlap might fall. I like almost every genre and I have such a wide taste of music. I'm sure I can find this with uh, a lot of people. And just maybe if we just even picked one artist like John Mayer that kind of connects us and talks about our love with that, I'm sure we could go into any other uh, genre that we think. So if there's any, you know, up and coming Canadian artists that you think I could get on to the podcast that you'd love to hear from, um, that'd be great. Or if you yourself are just a fan of a, a certain genre or certain artists that you'd want to come on here and talk about. I'm always looking for more ideas and more guests to uh, get as much practice as I can. You know, this is the open mic stage. Just got to find stage time, time behind the mic, people to converse with and just grow my skills as a podcaster, as an interviewer. So if you guys can help me with that, I'd really appreciate that. I've had some awesome success lately of just putting it out to the world and to the social media uh, uh, gods, if you will, of just, Hey, I need help with finding a guest for this, or I need help with this. And you guys have been really coming through and getting amazing responses. And I think I need to do that more and really uh, lean on you guys because you're the ones that are you know getting to hear all these. I should be listening to you on what you want to hear. So that's always really helpful. Like I say every week, if you give me a follow, share one of these posts that I, that I do, um, I really appreciate it when that happens. I get a lot out of it. The podcast grows each time. Every time somebody new gives a share on one of these pages, I get new downloads and it's a really fun thing to see and it goes a long way and it really warms my heart. If you ever feel the need to do that, you don't have to, but if you do, that's awesome. Following the social medias helps, sharing a page, um, writing a review, giving it five stars on Apple podcast that apparently helps. I've never really paid attention to the charts or anything, but apparently how their algorithm algorithms work, that really helps it. Um, same with getting this YouTube channel up and running. Um, if you really want to go that extra mile and help going to the YouTube page and liking the videos and even leaving a comment, even if it's just, you know, nothing just to show the algorithm that you are engaging with it, that really goes a long way. So if you guys want to go the extra mile, you can do those things. If not, I'm just so thankful you listened to the episode. I hope you got something out of it. And there's a whole catalog of 70 some odd episodes to go back through. If you just pick one or two that you think are interesting to you, I'm proud of each and every one of them and you can't go wrong. So yeah. If this is your first time, go back and check out some other ones. If you're returning, thank you so much. It means the world to me. And uh, yeah, it'll probably be another episode this week. If not, I'll see you on the next one. Bye. 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 Bye.